Good evening. Okay, finally unmuted. Um, good evening, everybody, or good late afternoon, I should say. Um, we now officially are going to start our second meeting in, in the same day. <laughs> Mayor Pearson? Yes. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti's not on yet, so I'm just going to step aside to call him, um, but you do have a call. Okay, thank you. Well, let's proceed with the opening bits here then. Um, I'm going to call to order the Malibu City Council special meeting for Thursday, February 25th, 2021. This meeting will be held via teleconference only in order to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19 and pursuant to the governor's executive orders number N-2520 and N-29-20 and the County of Los Angeles Public Health Officers Order all votes taken to the teleconference will be by roll call vote and the vote will be publicly reported. No physical location from which members of the public may observe this meeting and offer public comment will be provided. The meeting will be live streamed at malibucity.org forward slash video and malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Members of the public are encouraged to submit email correspondence to citycouncil at malibucity.org. How to, oh, hang on. Members of the public may also speak during the meeting through the Zoom application. You must first sign up to speak before the item you would like to speak has been called by the mayor, and then you must be present in the Zoom conference to be recognized. Once again, please visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting and follow the directions for signing up to speak and downloading the Zoom app as needed. Can we have roll call? Please. Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Silverstein? Here. Councilmember Yearing? Here. Mayor Pearson? Here. Do you have a quorum with Count, um, Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Do we have any update on Councilmember? Yes, he's trying to log on right now, so I assume he'll be on momentarily. Okay. Um, let's uh, proceed with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, the United of, America, States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for, which for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Can I have a, oh, there you are, Paul. Can I have a motion on the approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? I'll, I'll second. second. Yeah. Paul. Okay. okay, roll call on that, please. Give me just one second. Of course. Okay, Councilmember Fair. Yeah. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. Yes. Councilmember Yuri. Yes. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Can I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on February 18, 2021. Okay. Um, we're going straight. To item 1A, addressing homelessness in Malibu. We are going to have a number of presentations coming up um, to make sure we're all up to date on the current, the background and current efforts underway. Um, we're going to look at solutions implemented in other cities. We're going to have proposed solutions to consider for Malibu. We're going to have enforcement and legal considerations. Um, then we're going to have public comment um, and, uh, and Q&A, and then the council will uh, decide whether to move forward on something or not. Um, and yes, Steve? Uh, that was, my, I guess, my question. I'm just trying to figure out exactly when we get 
to the end of this? What do we expect this, our, the solution of this meeting to be? Or what's going to look like? I, I would guess on something as complicated and difficult as this and the amount of you know public input needed that we need to set what that next direction is. Yes, I think we need to take steps forward personally, but that's a council decision. Um, so the council could literally decide to do nothing and go home or the council can decide to, you know, do whatever they want. So um, that's our job. And um, I, we have to answer that as a group, to be honest. So, so you're, you've got no major objective in mind. That's all I'm just I know to... I think we need to move forward, but we'll get to all that. So uh, absolutely. So, I mean, I think it's a very complicated subject with huge amount of opinions. And I think it's very fair that at this point we have a presentation and we hear, we hear everyone's opinions and their thoughts on it. I think that's where we start. Then it comes back to council and we discuss it. Okay. So um, with that, um, I think I'm going to turn it over to you, Susan, I believe. Okay. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yes. You can do the next slide, Alex. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mikey, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as we all are well aware, the homeless crisis is increasing across the LA region and Malibu is feeling its effects. Uh, we assumed the responsibility for our outreach team in 2018, which includes two outreach workers and a housing navigator. And since that time, they've been able to move 136 people off the streets of Malibu. However, in spite of that uh, rather significant success, the numbers in Malibu, the, the numbers of homeless people are, are relatively static and the impact on our residents, on our neighborhoods, our parks and our open space have persisted. So we've really reached this point and the purpose of this meeting is to brainstorm on additional strategies and on ideas on how to move the needle on this problem. Um, so it basically saying in spite of our success, we, we need some more strategies. And uh, thank you, you already kind of went over the agenda, but I'll just kind of reiterate, we're gonna, begin with some background for people who have not been keeping up on what we've been doing very briefly. We're not gonna spend a ton of time on that. We'll have uh, someone from Supervisor Kuehl's office giving some regional background, Tiffany Stewart with the People Concern who will provide some background on what's happening in the city of Malibu, the outreach team, what they're seeing. Then I'll go over the uh, efforts of the city and then we have Lieutenant Jim Braden, who will go over the local law enforcement challenges that he's seeing currently with our current situation. And then I'll come back to me to go over strategies that some other cities similar to ours, what they're doing to address the problem. And we have Gabriel Graham, who will provide a lived homelessness perspective on what is helpful to helping homeless individuals. And then we have two proposals, as we know, uh, for consideration by the city council. So we'll hear those two proposals and then we'll hear from uh, law enforcement and city attorney's office to kind of just help us, you know, keep in mind the law enforcement and legal considerations we need to understand as we discuss the options and ideas as we move forward. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Rachel Simon, who is the homeless deputy with office Office of Supervisor Kuehl. So you can, next slide. Okay, Rachel, it's, a, it's your turn. Yes, thank you, Susan. Um, thank you so much for having me. I know homelessness is a gigantic topic to try and cover in five minutes. Um, I will do my best. I'm gonna spend a few minutes just chatting about what's driving the homelessness crisis, challenges we're experience, experiencing, how we've responded in COVID. Um, you know, while there are many factors that cause individuals and families to become homeless, our main drivers into homelessness in LA County are really a lack of affordable housing, unemployment and poverty. Our wages have not kept pace with rent and systemic racism. Um, we, for some context, we really saw homelessness increase in 2015. And the data told us that this huge increase was tied to economic factors. In response, the county created the Office of the Homeless Initiative, which is a subset of the CEO's office whose sole role is to address homelessness for the county. Um, and through a collaborative process with cities and service providers and folks with lived experience, we developed
develop 51 strategies to prevent and solve homelessness. That includes everything from prevention, outreach, interim housing, substance use services, and services in supportive housing. But um, to have the impact we wanted to have, we knew that we needed more resources. So in 2017, LA County voters passed Measure H, which is a quarter cent sales tax that for 10 years will generate re revenue that goes directly into funding homeless services. And we anticipate that Measure H revenue will be about 350 million a year. We've seen it increase, but we've also seen it drop like it did in the past year due to COVID. Prior to Measure H, uh, much of our homeless services system was really siloed by geographic region. And Measure H really allowed us as the county in partnership with cities and service providers and advocates to build out a regional countywide system. And there is still a tremendous amount of work to do. We all know that on the call. This is why we're here this evening. And um, though there have been significant steps forward um, in advancing our efforts. So, through a massive expansion of outreach and interim housing and permanent housing, thousands of families and individuals have moved out of homelessness and into permanent housing. Um, you know, like I said, services before were really siloed and concentrated in specific geographic regions. So for many, many years, many of our resources were concentrated in a few specific areas in the county. We know this, this is Skid Row, some in the Valley, um, but we know that many folks experiencing homelessness uh, are experiencing homelessness in or near communities that they were once housed, that they have family in, that they potentially worked in, where they have connections to. And trying to convince someone to move across the county to an unfamiliar region is really, really challenging and can be very scary. Um, there has been, luckily, a real expansion in solutions across the county. Uh, last summer, we opened a new bridge housing or interim housing program in Silmar. Three weeks ago, our office just opened a new bridge housing facility in Canoga Park, which is the first interim housing site in the West Valley, west of the 405, which is really exciting. Um, despite the positive outcomes, inflow into homelessness has outpaced our exits. And I think, Susan, you touched on that. Uh, prior to COVID, upstream prevention efforts had already been a top priority for Supervisor Kuehl. Um, the supervisor authored a series of motions that gosh, I'm going to try and remember, created the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So the county allocates $100 million a year towards housing preservation and development, affordable housing, I should say. Um, so that their clients they serve. Uh-oh. Uh oh, it looks like we're losing. Rachel, are you there? Apparently not. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stop my camera just for the time being because it's saying that my internet is unstable and that may be causing it. <laughs> okay. No problem. That's fine, Rachel. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I don't know where I cut off, but I was talking about the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, eviction defense program, um, and directing our mainstream county departments to really beef up their prevention efforts. Um, COVID obviously upended everything in every facet of life. Um, and so in addition to our everyday work, which is so important, um, we obviously solve homelessness one person at a time, one family at a time. Um, individuals, some can self-resolve. Many use a variety of services along the continuum from interim housing to permanent housing. Uh, our day-to-day -day efforts have all... Are, are all um, really focused on life-saving mm -hmm. efforts, so delivering meals, uh, testing, vaccines, all very important. Rachel, you're muted. Sorry, it said the host muted me. I just unmuted myself. Um, <laughs> These upstream efforts became all the more critical during COVID. And um, so while we've instituted an eviction moratorium, we've also significantly expanded our eviction defense program, which includes targeted education and outreach, all the way up to full scope legal assistance for low income tenants facing evictions. Um, and then finally, the board invested $110 million uh, in August into a COVID rental assistance program. So tenants who were income eligible in every area of the county, except the city of Los Angeles, because they had their own program. And while our program is still operating, the state is going to be operating a second COVID rental assistance program, um, allocating close to $300 million in federal fund, funds just for the LA County region, again, minusing 
Long Beach, Santa Clarita, um, and the city of LA who will have their own allocation of funds. Uh, I know that's a lot of information. I will just close with recognizing that homelessness, Susan, you touched on this, is very traumatic. It's really traumatic for people experiencing homelessness and it's really traumatic for our house community. It has impacts on our everyday life. Um, we are in the crisis we're in now because of decades of underinvestment. So what we're doing now is so critical. Um, I think it's just helpful to frame uh, and acknowledge that solving homelessness is a long end game. It took us 40 years to get here. It's going to take us some time to get out of it. That's all I have today. I think I hit my five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. We Thank you, Rachel. appreciate that. Uh, the the uh, regional perspective and regional and and I'm sorry, Rachel will be available uh, for a little bit after our convert after the presentation. If you have additional questions. All right. So next up, we're going to have Tiffany Stewart with the People Concern. She's one of our uh, amazing outreach workers. So take it away, Tiffany. Hi. Um, so um, today I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about who our clients are in Malibu and some of the, the challenges and barriers that we face with um, housing people that are experiencing homelessness. So um, our clients are just as diverse in character as you and I. They come from a wide variety of backgrounds from every state of the union. They're black, white, brown, some have college degrees, some are fleeing from domestic violence, some are orphans and abandoned by the system, some are residents of Malibu that have been displaced in some way or another. But because they're so diverse, the solution and variety of services which are needed can be just as varied. Um, some of the problems with providing services is the lack of transitional housing and mental health services that are available. Um, while most severe, most of the severe mentally ill um, issues require long-term care, possibly medication, and ultimately a stable living situation um, in which these people can undergo treatment and services are few and far between. When looking to fill them, we have a, a very difficult time placing people with the needs that they have, like immediately. So every day it's a steep uphill climb for survival when on the streets, every everyday problems by um, the like needs of nutrition, someone to talk to and a safe place to just simply exist. We're currently engaged with approximately 70 individuals experiencing homelessness in Malibu. 40 of two of these individuals are considered to be in various levels of engagement, while 30 of them are refusing services at this time. Um, Based on our observation, the bulk of the people in the homeless population in Malibu have traveled here, I, I believe due to climate. Um, just this month, there was at, at one time it was 70% of the country was covered in snow. So they came here from other parts of the world to in other parts of the country to enjoy the California sunshine. Some of these individuals journeyed straight to Malibu while others ended up here after living in surrounding cities like downtown LA, Santa Monica, and Venice. And due to safety concerns, a lot of people have expressed to me that they've traveled to Malibu because as you know, the homeless um, population in these other cities and surrounding cities are far outweigh the population in Malibu. So they kind of travel up the coast for, I think for a little bit more safe feeling to feel more safe. Um, we feel that our biggest challenge that we're facing within the current system is that there's no immediate solution. There's nowhere for them to go. In a perfect world, we'd be able to offer every person we encounter a place to go, but we can't. Um, aside from being able to give them supplies they need to make them a bit more comfortable, most of what we can offer is help along the, along the way of a longer journey to housing. Um, we need more transitional housing shelters where people can stay as they journey forward into their to permanent housing. Uh, for example, when we meet a homeless individual at most times, all I can offer them is a meal or a blanket or a sleeping bag. But how awesome would it be if I could actually offer them a safe place to go as we take them down the road of independence? Uh, another problem we're facing is with subsidies and affordable housing. Los Angeles County is ranked number nine in the nation for the highest cost of living, which makes it difficult for working class people to afford to live here, let alone our clients. Most of the people we serve only receive public assistance, which is about $220 a month, 
and $185 in food benefits. Um, if they're lucky they get social security, which is about $1,000 a month. And, you know, as we know, that's, that's no, no one can really live off of that. So I think that if we had um, easier access to subsidies, um, if we were able to allocate them in a different way, there's a lot of red tape that goes on when, when trying to get um, our clients into the subsidy programs that, um, that would help us a lot to move people into to permanent housing a lot quicker. Um, Unfortunately, because there, it is a lengthy process from the street to safe housing, I found that a lot of individuals give up in, uh, in, instead of actually kind of waiting for it to happen because it, it is a process. Um, these are hard answers, hard problems. Let us not be confused. It's a humanitarian crisis on a biblical scale. We need more supportive transitional housing, and I think that's our biggest barrier. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay. Thank you, Tiffany. That was great. Um, not great. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's hard news to hear, uh, but thank you for that. Um, I'm going to briefly go over. Uh, let's go next slide, Alex. I'm going to go over very briefly where the city of Malibu is. Thank you. Um, so as many people here probably remember, we had our last uh, meeting on homelessness just over a year ago. And at that time, the city council directed us to do a few things. Uh, one of the things that we were asked to do is to explore the Malibu Courthouse as a temporary shelter. We did that. Uh, there was We did a walkthrough in March. But what we came to find out is part of the courthouse is actually controlled by the state's judicial council, and they were not interested in changing the use of that building. So that's not going to work out. We were also asked to explore safe parking program options, which the Malibu Homelessness Working Group went right to work on that, looking for various options. There was brief conversation about a parking lot by Malibu Seafood. That didn't work out. And they took a look at Dan Blocker Beach parking lot, which did not work out. That was taken to the Public Safety Commission and definitely did not work out, according to the community who came out in opposition. And then uh, we looked at Zuma Beach parking lot, uh, working with beaches and harbors. They were willing to uh, entertain that idea. And we attempted to do a, a zoning change in that area. It was like last summer it was. Um, and that zoning change did not get approved. So we've tried a, a, a variety of areas with safe parking, uh, but we're still not with any uh, options right now. So that's still kind of on the back burner as something to possibly be worked on. Uh, we were also asked to uh, look and determine if we had additional staffing needs. Uh, we identified that we definitely could use additional staff to work on this issue. It was brought up at the mid-year budget meeting a couple of weeks ago, and it was determined at that time that we should put it on hold and save it for this meeting. So based on the conversation and based on what strategies we want to move forward, that would better inform if we're going to have a position to ass assist with this, we want to make sure the job description accurately reflects whatever decisions are made this evening. Uh, we were asked to explore outside funding sources, which we did. And, uh, you know, really the predominant source of funding remains Measure H, which we have been very successful in getting in the past. And I suspect that we will continue to be successful at getting those funds. We were also asked to explore successful approaches in other cities, which we have done, and I'll go over that a little bit more um, in, a, in, in a little bit. Um, ongoing efforts include our contract with the People Concern. As I mentioned earlier, we took full responsibility for the contract in 2018. Um, it actually started in 2016 with the Malibu Task Force on Homelessness, which was a grassroots organization that wanted to try it out, they raised money, they hired the team, and then the city slowly assumed responsibility for the team. And they've been doing a great job, as I said, over since 2018, they've been able to move 136 people off the street. So that is not a small number, that is very, um, made a big difference in our community, but as we all know, um, the problem is persisting. Um, we also have an outreach coordinator, coordinator through the Las Virginas Malibu Council of Governments. It's a shared resource. 
Uh, Gabriel, who's going to be speaking next, has been amazing. He's our go-to guy. He has lived experience. He understands the homeless issue as well as anybody. And he's been our guy to call for a variety of issues. And, and generally speaking, all the COG cities, we we said that we didn't necessarily need another you know, caseworker. What we needed was somebody who was available that we could call as issues come up, kind of in lieu of calling a deputy. We don't wanna to have to call the sheriffs every time there's an issue involving a homeless individual, especially if there's no public safety threat at the time. So Gabriel has really filled that role to help us uh, handle situations that involve a homeless individual and he can speak with them, get them connected to the team. Um, and he'll tell you more about what he does, but that's been great. Oh, also, uh, we've been very busy removing illegal encampments. We do them fairly regularly. Uh, just like in the last, say, four or five months, we removed eight encampments in the Tuna Canyon area. More recently, we uh, helped coordinate the removal of encampments, four encampments in the Civic Center area. Legacy Park is a regular location where we do almost weekly cleanups in that park. Um, We're also right now in the middle of assisting, coordinating, and helping beaches and harbors with an encampment at Zuma Creek. So these are ongoing things, but I, I think in the end, all these encampment cleanups are really more of a, an ongoing land maintenance because it's never a permanent eradication of encampments. They invariably come back um, because there is no place for these people to go. And that's the reality, but we are, doing everything we can to protect our environment, protect our parks uh, through those cleanups. We also, um, to address the issue of vehicles, RVs on Pacific Coast Highway and staying extended periods of time, we have implemented parking restrictions as probably many of you have noticed with the uh, you know alternating on side with no parking from, what is it like? two to four and then four to six or one to three, whatever it is, it's <laughs> two hours. Anyways, it makes it more difficult for people to park and spend the night on PCH. And that has actually had a very significant impact um, in terms of reducing the number of RVs. And I can tell you from our homeless count that the uh, number of vehicles when we did the homeless count in 2020, which is when we really felt that the impact of RVs moving into Malibu because of the parking restrictions that had been implemented in Los Angeles County and they moved up into our city. The number of vehicles when we did homeless count that year was 132. But a couple of weeks ago when we did our own homeless count, and I say our own because the county count was canceled, but we decided to do our own count. And when we did that count, the number of vehicles had been reduced to 73. So that's a pretty good dent uh, with those parking restrictions. And we continue to, and I think we just recently uh, got approval for the uh, oversized vehicle ordinance too. So these efforts are helping to reduce the uh, impact of vehicles parked on PCH. Um, also, we have a homelessness strategic plan which was adopted by the city council in 2018. And from that plan, the group, the stakeholders that were part of that plan have continued on as the homelessness working group, which meets monthly and more recently, we've been meeting every two weeks to um, update the homelessness strategic plan. So I think that's enough of me <laughs> with our current efforts. And at this point, I wanna bring up Gabriel Graham who can talk a little bit about uh, lived experience and the kinds of things that are helpful for helping homeless people um, from the homeless person's perspective. Not that he's homeless anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi everybody. The hi, next Gabriel. slide, please. Oh, sorry. Should we even go back? Says Jim Brayden next. Go one more. Maybe, you know, you know what? You're right. Jim Brayden's next. I'm sorry. I got my order wrong. I'm sorry. So, Jim, are you out there somewhere? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry. Okay. My mistake. Jim Brayden's next to talk about the local law enforcement challenges right now. Okay. And, uh, yeah, listening to what Rachel said and Tiffany and also Susan, I'll, I'll play off a couple things. The uh, um, 
Well, I, I rewatched our meeting from January 29th, uh, 2020. And it's kind of interesting because this was pre pandemic. It was for law enforcement, it was pre George Floyd and all the protests across the country. Um, some of the things I said last time, which I won't change, it's one of the number one things in policing. It's been brought up all over the country. It has to be that police officers respect the constitutional rights of the public. Everything we do has to respect that. And any ordinance we create has to respect that, period. Our end of enforcement is not one to challenge what courts have said their rulings are. Yeah, we create case law through different things, but we don't purposefully go out and try to challenge what a court is saying. I think, just like was already mentioned before I spoke, this problem's been going on 40 years or more. I remember living in Redondo Beach in the late 70s and 80s, and we lived near the pier, and there was a homeless concentration there. Uh, beach communities are conducive with people wanting to come. Um, I believe just like was spoken earlier, yeah, I've talked to people, I've actually taken different people to lunch and figure out how they end up in Malibu. And a lot of it is, is the homeless population's thinner. They feel safer. Um, it's important that one, that constitutional rights are supported for individuals, that it's seen that, um, all the protests all over the country aren't just over race. It's also about people's economic status in life. And it has to be respected that people end up on the streets all kinds of different ways. It could be from unemployment. It could be from medical issues. It can be from mental issues. It can be from addiction issues. It can be all kinds of things. And the problem there, in, in my belief, there's not going to be just one solution to it. That's why it's important that we all listen to each other and be open to everybody's ideas on things to see what works, because it'll be a combination of things. Susan mentioned a couple of things. Um, over a year, year and a half ago, the discussion came up in the Public Safety Council about trying to get signage through the pass through the Coastal Commission to approve the signage along PCH to limit the parking along PCH. Um, it came almost at the right time. The last meeting we had, we were in the height of uh, having Las Tunas filled with motorhomes, having Zuma filling up, having Corral all the way full. And there's been a huge impact on that. And just on Friday, um, it came through that the Coastal Commission did not appeal the oversized ordinance um, for oversized vehicles along PCH, which means we're going to be able to enforce that. So it further supports the signs that we got just months ago. And the way it further supports it, it covers almost all areas of Malibu, and it enforces it between the hours of midnight and 5 a.m. It gives specifications for vehicles over 23 feet in length, and it gives specifications on any exceptions. It also gives specifications for residents uh, seeking a permit through the city for a temporary 72-hour pass for their motorhome to be in the city. And that, along with the signs that already exist, it will further have an impact on uh, camping along PCH. And, and will affect the amount of uh, whether you want to consider them campers, motorhomers, whatever they are, that it's not free camping along PCH, simple as that. So that is something that was in the works. It's something that's positive that's been going on. Um, one of the other major issues, and it is for us as well as all the residents of Malibu, I worked and was in the field the day of the Woolsey fire. We can have terrible, terrible fires here where people lose everything they work for in life. And we are lucky we didn't lose more lives than that. But just over the last season, all the wins we've had. And then we have people living in encampments back on properties. Okay. I, I can't express this enough 
being there's 19 and a half square miles, I understand what Susan says about, oh, we cleaned up this many encampments and we did this. There's 19 and a half square miles in Malibu. That's a lot of territory, a lot. And there should be an ordinance within the city of Malibu for raw pieces of property without houses on. It. And that ordinance should read that those people that own those properties that enjoy values going up in the properties, that they need to provide for securities of those properties. Like there has to be like some time stipulation, whether it's two weeks, whether it's a month, that they have to somehow uh, safeguard those properties and make us aware if an encampment builds up on it. That And I understand that they've gone to lengths of getting letters of agencies, but it doesn't change the fact there's 19 and a half square miles of Malibu. There's no way for it to be patrolled by deputy sheriffs, all these properties, that those owners somehow have to be accountable for policing their piece of property. That could keep these encampments from building up. And... Just like there's probably a proposal for shelters and different things. Like I said, it's going to be a combination of things. But having some form of shelter to where something's provided, to where I'm allowed by the courts to have my people go out and enforce laws and keep people from encampments on property that they're, they're not allowed, period. Because law enforcement's hands being tied, and I've worked in Malibu where we don't have this issue. So it, it's come on the, the front burner. It's definitely concerns like with fires and everything else. It's been a societal problem that's been festering for decades. It's not as simple as one meeting and what we're going to achieve in one meeting. It's a start. But I would say these parking things we've initiated that can alleviate some of the over camping of PCH. If we or have some type of ordinance regarding these encampments on private properties and policing of them, it would assist us in protecting the city residents as long as, and as well as travelers and also guests to the city, for, uh, protect them from fires and everything else. Okay, thank you, Jim, we appreciate that. Um, I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you. Um, so next up, I just want to briefly, you know, now that we kind of, you know, set the stage with the challenges and what we're currently doing, now we're going to turn to solutions. So really briefly, I just, you know, we've been, we, when I say we, that's the Malibu Homelessness Working Group. Uh, we've all been busy looking at uh, solutions in other communities and just a few that I can point out that are all kind of, you know, maybe different or traditional uh, such as Laguna Beach, which is one, a group of us went down there uh, last February to see they have an alternative sleeping location, which they actually put in place, I think, over 10 years ago in response to a lawsuit from the ACLU. But it really helped them clean up their beach. That's one of the big takeaways we got from that. So basically, it was a place that when law enforcement needed to uh, ask an individual to <laughs> tell them that they couldn't camp somewhere, it provided an alternative sleeping location. So then it made it easier for them to enforce their anti-camping laws. Uh, more recently, city of Rondondo Beach, another beach community that is being hard hit by homeless, um, they're uh, putting in tiny houses as a pilot project. They found a parking lot and they're putting in enough tiny houses for about, I think about 30 people and they're gonna try that out. Um, city of Ventura, a little, you know, north of us, they also grappling with this and they just opened recently or a year ago, sorry, uh, just a more traditional 24 hour uh, shelter in the city to help manage the issue. And then going a little further up north, I found it interesting up in Olympia, Washington, which is also really struggling with this issue. Um, they decided to just open managed encampments and they call them uh, mitigation sites where they allow people who are living in tents to live in these locations. And it's somewhat self-managed, but also managed by, you know, city staff, uh, nonprofits who are also working with them. They're doing case management. They're trying to get people off the street, but they've designated places where people can legally set up their tent and they actually have several mitigation sites now. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a variety of different methods. 
I'm in all of these uh, different things, uh, lots of different cities across, you know, especially the Western side of the United States are doing similar versions of all of these things for us to look at. Um, and so now I want to hand it to Gabriel because I think it's helpful to always, you know, kind of hear from the perspective of, from someone who's had that lived homelessness perspective on the kinds of things that are helpful for helping homeless people as we discuss possible solutions. So Gabriel, now you're up for real. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm Gabriel Graham. I, I do, I'm an outreach coordinator for the Las Virginia's Malibu Cog. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm a local. I, I'm from Woodland Hills originally, and so as as a child, I'm just going to tell a little bit of my story because I think everybody's really covered the majority of the of the big issues. Um, I used to go to Malibu when I was a kid. When we went to the beach, that's where we went. So I'm um, familiar with the area, and um, unfortunately, I made some very poor decisions as a child. Um, I got into drugs early, and 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 battled addiction my whole life. Um, when I finally became homeless. I, I tried being in the valley for a while, and that was just way too hot and too dirty. And I went out to Venice Beach, and that was way too crowded, way too violent. And so I, I made my way to Malibu, and, and I was there for five years. I got there in 2012, 13, um, and, and that's where I stayed. I stayed there because it was beautiful. It was clean. It was familiar. I could I could get clean in the ocean, and um, I could find some work if I needed to at the, the day labor place. Um, I was uh, very, uh, I guess, what's the word? I, I don't know. I, I didn't understand, I guess, why there wasn't, and at this time, there was nothing going on as far as help, helping the homeless. There was no assistance at all. It was it pretty much, um, the situation was completely ignored. And so I struggled and struggled and continued to, to live on the streets. Um, and then... Uh, the people concerned came around and, and they brought the outreach team out and I started working with, with um, the first uh, case manager, Alex Gittinger. And um, he was, he saved my life. And because of also compassion of people like Father Paul Elder, who took an interest in my situation and was there, um, I decided to, to turn my life around. And um, early on, I think I was still on the streets when I started working um, with the with Susan Duenas and the um, homeless working group. And I just showed up and I, and I kind of um, answered questions and, and gave the perspective of, of what it's like living on the streets in Malibu. And um, because I've been deeply embedded with a lot of the individuals out there as, as a homeless person, and then now also as, um, I don't want to say caseworker, but as maybe a, an advocate, um, the vast majority of, of these guys out there are, are really good people. You know, they're out there for the same reasons, because they feel safer. Um, <clears throat> they're not the ones that are doing damage or breaking into stuff. They, they kind of just want to be left alone. And some of them are becoming a lot more interested in getting services. Um, they, it just takes time to build relationships and to build trust. Um, so like Susan said, I, I respond to requests from the city. If there's a, an encampment that's out of control or there's trash everywhere, I'll, I'll go and I have no qualms about, you know, being being tough and telling these guys they got to clean up, you know, and um, I always mention the people concerned and if they're, you know, receiving services or, you know, if, if in a good place to, to connect with them is, you know, at the lunches that they do <clears throat> three times a week. So, again, I just try to advocate. I answer questions. Um, I'll help people with whatever they need to get to get prepared. To either you know uh, do an intake with the, the case case workers or if they need to get um, services from from like you know uh, food stamps or GR. Um, so uh, you know my I do a lot of different things and um, I just I want to try to help build that bridge between the two communities that are struggling to find common ground. That's about all I have. Right. Thank you, Gabriel. I appreciate that. And Gabriel will remain available as we have our discussions after all of this. So, okay. So up next, we're going to be looking at proposals, specific proposals for Malibu. Uh, first, we have Paul Davis, who's a Malibu resident and a member of our Malibu Homelessness Working Group, who will be talking about uh, a possible alternative sleeping location. Take it away, Paul. And I guess Paul has a PowerPoint of its own that needs to come up.
All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Honorable mayor, honorable council members, dear friends and, and neighbors. It's it's an honor to, to represent the city's working group on homelessness and present our plan to address homelessness in Malibu. Our plan is one that is proven, having been successfully implemented elsewhere, and will both allow the sheriffs to once again enforce city ordinances and at the same time um, provide homeless individuals with a real path to sustainable housing. I would also note that this plan and, and Bruce's plan are not contradictory. Both plans can stand on their own merits. And this presentation offers a summary of a detailed operating plan created by the working group. And by way of introduction, my name is Paul Davis. I've lived here in Malibu for about a decade. I've been, I've been married for three years and have a 15 month little, 15 month old little girl who is both smart, smart and adorable. Uh, traits she gets from her mother, for those of you scratching your heads right now. I've I spent a long time with uh, uh, studying various pro programs across the nation that address homelessness. I've seen ones that work and ones that don't. Uh, some that are tremendously successful and some well-meaning programs that unfortunately made things worse. This program draws on the experience and wisdom of individuals both within and without our working group. I personally applied these principles myself in my own individual efforts with homeless individuals and learned much from experience firsthand. Uh, next slide, please. The purpose of this program is twofold. One is to protect all Malibu residents. This plan will enable LA County sheriffs to enforce existing camping laws as it offers the homeless a local alternative. It will restore access to parks, the library, and other public spaces and it will improve fire safety and allow us to remove all illegal encampments. This program will also help unhoused Malibu residents transition to sustainable housing. Now, first priority will go to those individuals with clearly defined and established ties to Malibu, and then to others on a triage basis to the extent we have room. It will focus on building self-reliance and, and reducing dependence, a hand up rather than just a handout and it will act as a base to provide access to mental health care and other health services to those who are enrolled. And next slide, please. The Malibu ASL is based on an existing successful facility in Laguna Beach, a city that is in so many ways very much like our own. The Laguna Beach Alternative Sleeping Location, or ASL, is a temporary housing facility owned by the city of Laguna Beach and operated since 2009 under contract with a local nonprofit. We are honored to have Don Price, the executive director of that program, of that nonprofit here with us tonight to discuss her experience and to answer questions. The focus of the Laguna Beach ASL is on transitioning the homeless to permanent housing quickly, and the average length of stay is under two months. While 2020 reporting is challenged by the pandemic, in 2019 they were able to house 48 people mostly in un unsubsidized housing. And next slide, please. The facility is pretty small. It's just 40 beds for enrolled participants, but that's enough to, because it establishes, it allows them to take care of their own. Every homeless person with established ties to Laguna Beach, and then others to the extent they have capacity. Meals at the Laguna ASL are provided to enrolled participants by faith, by local faith organizations. Participants also have access to help with documentation and medical care, as well as personal storage. The Laguna ASL is closely coordinated with local police and other civic authorities. And what is key for enforcement of city camping prohibitions is that it reserves five beds for law enforcement. This way, when their police come across someone illegally camping, they are always able to offer an alternative to the individual. The person doesn't have to go to the ASL, but because the person does have the option, the police can take action if they refuse. Next slide, please. Here's some actual pictures from Laguna Beach in 2009 before the ASL was in place. Unfortunately to those of us in Malibu, this looks all too familiar. Beaches and parks occupied trash and personal items and police unable to do much about it because there wasn't a local option for these individuals. Next slide, please. Uh, 
those who were there in 2009 in Laguna Beach will tell you that the improvement came, the improvement that once the ASL was put, put in place was drastic and almost immediate. Uh, residents quickly saw a drastic, dramatic reduction in trash and encampments, night and day. And many of the homeless were able to transition to permanent housing somewhere, most of which has been, was, un, was unsubsidized. And of critical importance, this program has been legally tested. Laguna Beach endured painful litigation with the ACLU after this was in place, and after spending millions of, in defense, arrived at a settlement with the ACLU, pursuant to which they now operate today. And we now have the privilege of adopting a plan that has already been through that crucible, sparing Malibu the cost and time of error and the significant expense of litigation defense. And next slide, please. The Malibu ASL is designed around key elements of the Laguna Beach ASL that made it successful. Uh, given our smaller population, we would have 30 program beds. Like Laguna Beach, first priority for our ASL goes to individuals with clear and established ties to Malibu and then to others on a triage basis. And in order to stay, participants must be working towards sustainable housing. There's no attraction to come to Malibu for the ASL as priority goes to established locals with limited capacity capped at those 30 enrolled participants. And like Laguna, we would also have five emergency beds reserved for sheriffs. This will mean the ASL will always have capacity on any night and therefore allow the sheriffs to enforce no camping laws because the individual does have an alternative. Next slide, please. Our guiding principles at the ASL are these, self-reliance. We're, we're focusing our resources to help people develop independence to the extent they're able, not to make them more dependent. We're trying to empower, not enable. Some will require more help than others, but participants must be working toward a sustainable housing solution. As Mother Teresa said, compassion being the second principle here, probably the first, small things are done with great love. Small things done with great love will change the world. And to take a page from the Army Ranger Creed, we shouldn't leave one of our own behind who is willing to accept and get back on our feet. It may take time and it may take effort. It will take effort. And it may take some patience and compassion, but we can make a difference and help people rise, uh, rise to higher levels of accomplishment and rise back towards self-reliance. Um, and third is community engagement. As we've done so far and even more still, we can leverage the best ideas, goodwill, and talents of the Malibu community as Malibu residents are able to serve and uplift and work with those in needs. This is a community effort. So we're coming together on this, bringing everybody together, diverse perspectives, so that we can come to something that is a win-win for everybody. And next slide, please. The ASL will, of course, provide access to the physical essentials, shelter, while they're working towards a sustainable permanent housing solution somewhere, food provided by local nonprofits to enrolled participants, clothing, donated articles available as needed, and medical care, including mental health and substance abuse health. And next slide, please. However, even more important are what I call the three human needs. Every human being on the planet needs three things, real friendship, purpose, and whole education. First, real friendship. Everyone needs to know that someone cares about them, not just because they're paid to, but someone who cares because they care. Being treated like a human being is one of the things that's too often missing from a homeless person's life. And so the ASL will provide a base for one-on-one -on -one mentorship programs, big brother, big sister type opportunities where Malibu residents can connect with and support participants in a safe environment. That relationship alone can provide needed inspiration and motivation to a participant to improve their circumstances. Second is purpose. We all need to need And indeed, it's how it's helping people discover that for themselves and discover that, that need and, and feel that. Something. Paul, we have a bad connection with you. All right, I'm sorry, where was I? Okay, we didn't miss much. I think you're good. Okay, um, all right. Um, on purpose, uh, we're all needed. 
everyone's needed. Purpose can come from any places, including a job uh, or a service opportunity or in other ways. We'll have job programs, service needs, and the like to help participants gain a greater sense of purpose. And participants will be engaged in local, local veteran projects, neighborhood cleaning, landscaping, improvements, and such, uh, which will make the ASL and surrounding, uh, surrounding area clean and attractive. And, and third is whole education. Even with support and motivation, we all need to know how to manage our lives, our money, how to cope, how to work, how to get a job. And the ASL will provide a base for that process. Uh, next slide, please. One critical thing to know, of course, about the homeless is that they're not a group or a statistic. One side generally does not fit all. We're all individuals, and we need to have a tailored approach to each person by name to address their particular challenges and build on their unique strengths. Next, coordinated care, care is paramount. There's so many good services and so much good help out there, but so often people fail or fall through the cracks because of a certain unmet need or a poor transition from one step to another. As key stakeholders, counsel together regularly to make sure we are, given, uh, we are giving each individual a proper type and amount of support throughout their progression. We can more effectively help them succeed. Uh, next slide, please. Three important comments on the ASL with respect to public safety. First, participation is by enrollment only. These are known individuals striving for self-betterment and must remain program compliant to stay at the ASL. Those who won't, who frankly are the ones causing most of the trouble in Malibu, won't be allowed to camp in our city. And the ASL will offer computer access and showers to participants, eliminating the need for uh, library, uh, you know, to library for, for, for such things. And second, the ASL will be surrounded by a green zone or a zero tolerance area around the ASL with heightened sheriff patrols and presence to keep the area safe and help it feel safe. And third, as discussed with an ASL, there would no longer be any encampments at all permitted in Malibu as the ASL programs with its emergency bed capacity provide a legal basis for sheriffs to remove all illegal encampments. Next slide, please. Now, a quick note on the legal background of, of why that is. As many of you know, the court case, Martin versus Boise, was the Ninth Circuit decision that, quote, a municipality cannot criminalize such behavior, that is sleeping in public spaces, when no sleeping place is practically available in any shelter, unquote. And this decision was recently allowed to stand by the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, it is, of course, very important to understand that it doesn't matter what you or I think may or may not be enforceable under Martin versus Boise. What is important to realize is that because Malibu law enforcement is provided by the LA County Sheriff's Department, that Malibu is subject to LA County's interpretation of Martin versus Boise. We need to do something that they accept as providing legal basis, or they will not be they will not enforce our encampment prohibitions. Next slide, please. Now, this is an important, a very helpful and critical undertaking, and it needs to be done now. Fortunately, we can do it on a pilot basis with a fixed initial operating period. If it doesn't help the way it's intended or provide the same benefits uh, it provided Laguna Beach residents, we can end it, modify it, and do something else. And the ASL will be built using modular construction, which, which will allow for rapid deployment, as well as removal or modification as the need, uh, as the need be. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, of course, we need to we need to act now. Homelessness is already a crisis, and will only get worse where when evictions are allowed to resume. Uh, but together, we can solve this. In public and fire safety, with zero homeless encampments permitted, restored access to parks, the library, and other public spaces, improved aesthetics to a beautiful city, with reduced trash, pollution, and personal items and community improvements, including veteran projects and community services by facility participants. Together we can clean up our city, make it safer, and help people in need rise to higher levels of accomplishment and in greater measure have the dignity of greater independence. As they say, it takes a village. And, and I've been grateful to work with so many of you um, on this. And I look forward to working with, uh, with more of you as we come together as a community uh, to make a huge difference here. Uh, many thanks to, to so many who provided help, input, advice, support, 
um, please reach out to Susan or me if we can be helpful or if you'd like to, to be uh, more involved. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That was a very good presentation. All right, I'll give Alex a second to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, next up we have Bruce Silverstein, our very own city council member who also has a proposal uh, that he will present now. Take it away, Bruce. Hi, everybody. So um, Paul and I have had a lot of conversations over the past few months, and um, that was a great presentation. Um, I'll have some comments on it later, but on paper looks phenomenal. And I got to say, the proposal that Steve Uring and I have made is one that assumes that we don't have an ASL and we need to proceed with something to protect the health, safety and welfare of the community. Uh, despite, in, in, and not in contrast with the Boise opinion, but, but complicit, consistent with the Boise opinion. But in any event, um, Paul says that if the ASL provision uh, proposal is adopted, we can enforce the existing laws. There's no need for an alternative law such as we've proposed because our law is not as good as the laws that are on the books. Our law was an alternative to the law that's on the books, which we're told we can't enforce. So I'm, I'm going to say it, in December of 2020, less than two weeks after being seated on city council, Steve and I introduced this proposal. It's a proposal to amend the no camping ordinance to protect the health, safety and welfare of the community. Mm -hmm. And we believe that it can be accomplished consistent with Martin versus Boise and consistent with there not being in place, at least not yet, if not ever, in ASL. Uh, the proposal was on the agenda for the city council meetings of January 11, January 25 and January 28. I had prepared a 25 page PowerPoint to explain the intricacies of the proposal and address some of the objections that had been raised, but I was prohibited from presenting it. Um, instead, city council voted that I would present it tonight. Well, the agenda for tonight's meeting came out a week ago and the proposal wasn't on the agenda. Just a few days ago, I was told I could have five minutes to present the proposal, which is wholly inadequate. Uh, nobody had conferred with me about the schedule. Um, Paul requested additional time, which I thought was a great idea. I thought he should have my time as well because I couldn't pr present mine in five, 10 or 15 minutes. And I'm glad he got 15 minutes. Um, a few days ago, I received from the city attorney a memo that purports to analyze the legal issues pertaining to this proposal if we don't have an ASL. I wasn't consulted in connection with the present preparation of that memo. No questions were asked of me. It does inaccurately describe some of the details of the proposal, and I think it offers a fairly superficial legal analysis, which could have been avoided if I had been consulted, but I wasn't. So, you know, last night there was an agenda item to accept and file a geology report pertaining to the stability of Big Rock Mesa. There was a 23 page staff report. There were 33 pages of exhibits and the geologists presented a 36 page PowerPoint that took 45 minutes to go through. That was simply to receive a report and no potential action by the city council was being requested. This is a serious subject and it's not one that could be addressed in five or 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm not gonna waste the public's time providing an arbitrarily abbreviated presentation so the opponents can then take pot shots at something that was not adequately explained. I suspect that it won't stop some people from making stump speeches, but I'll spare the public at least a part of the dog and pony show. But in any event, as I said, if Paul's proposal is adopted, that's great because that means we don't need an alternative law. We have the laws in place. If any member of the public's interested in reading the actual proposal and the PowerPoint, they're available from the city clerk. I'd be happy to talk to anybody offline, but it can't be explained in 10 minutes. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to try, but I'll pass. Okay. All right, so next up, we're gonna hear from Jim Braden again um, to kind of talk about in terms of the ideas that have been discussed thus far, kind of the law enforcement perspective and things we need to consider as we discuss this more. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I've had, just like Paul's had conversations with Bruce, I've had conversations with Paul. I've talked to Bruce also. And like I said earlier, it's going to be a combination of effort of things. It's not going to be some perfect one fit all 
Uh, and it's a fluid situation to where things change and to where over time that um, something that works today or this year can change in months or years. So it's something that needs to be addressed. And just reading different articles, it's it's an interesting topic. It's all over the world. It's, it's not limited to just um, the U.S., there is places where there's successful things going on in Bakersfield and Whittier, uh, Redondo Beach with their little, they're like pallet houses they used in Katrina, which housed two people. Um, the thing that intrigues me somewhat about like Paul's idea is it's something that could be tried. If, if it doesn't have a result, it can be stopped also. There are a lot of this modular housing and everything else, it's not, it's something that can be tried. The, uh, I myself had the opportunity for 10 plus years to go build houses in Tijuana and also Tecate. It's all for people that didn't have money to build their own house. And through a thing called the Moore Ministry, they arranged to help finance properties and we built small, tiny houses on it and it changed people's lives. There, is that the perfect answer to everything? No. And like Paul went into, which I totally believe, this isn't a crutch or some permanent fix for someone's life. It's to try to get them on a path to where they can go somewhere else and be a productive member of society. Because abandoning people, it's not going to be the answer. And, and, and just like with Bruce's plan, I'm not going to say Bruce's plan's all bad because it's not. I admire Bruce's tenacity. I admire that he cares about his community. And I admire that all of us together, we can have an impact on these things. Because that's the truth of it. And it takes everybody to work together. The, um, like I said, a combination of these laws along the highway, limiting parking. I think the fire thing's a very important component in Malibu. It always is with the fight, with the winds that come up, with the heat, with the amount of brush, everything else. This is going to be a continuous thing. And so that's something to address. And also some form of shelter or some form of regulation to where we can legally take actions with people. Because I've done my job 30 years and my profession is under attack as far as using a constitutional basis for actions. We take physical actions with people. When they don't do what we tell them to do, we take physical actions. I'm the watch commander at Lost Hill Station. I'm on duty right now. I have 26 different cars in the field. They go to calls. They take independent action with people. Um, Body cameras have been introduced over the last months. Almost every single deputy now in the field has a body camera on. They're required to activate them at all calls. They're required to activate them on all contacts with anybody. And that, in my world, that aids me in investigations. It aids me in knowing what goes on. It aids me in knowing that people are following the laws. But those initial laws, they have to have a basis for them to where I can do that too. So that would, that's where I would respect that I've done my job 30 years. I've done it in a professional way. I demand the people that work for me do their job in a professional way, period. I've always believed in that. And Malibu is a beautiful community, but this is something that needs to be addressed. And if it's not addressed or it's just continuous in, in, in people argue over and over and over and nothing ever goes anywhere, um, the state within a year or two will probably rectify that for you. Because right. when you appoint a homeless czar and they appoint people to, for you to come up with a plan that they're going to monitor for, that it's going to be initiated. This is a crisis across this country. It's a crisis in California. It is absolute crisis in LA County and it will be addressed at some point because okay. there's not going to be an acceptance. Right. Okay, thank you, Jim. We're going to um, thank you very much for that. Uh, finally, we're going to end with uh, our interim city attorney, John Cotty, um, just to kind of get sort of the, the legal perspective on 
things that we should be thinking about or, or keep in mind as we consider strategies. Um, go ahead, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was initially asked to address the legal issues associated with the two proposals that were before you tonight. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Silverstein's um, camping proposal and the ASL proposal that, uh, that was also proposed. Um, what I would say is that with regard to the camping proposal, I was asked to prepare a memo by the council detailing our office's view of whether that proposal was legal. We've done that. We've provided that memo to the council as requested by the council and they've got it and can share it as they deem appropriate. Um, suffice it to say that uh, there is no decision of law upholding a permit requirement like the one proposed by Council Member Silverstein. We've reviewed it and in our opinion, a court's likely to find that a homeless person could not, as a practical matter, satisfy the requirements for a permit. That's not to say, and, and what, I, what do I mean by that? What if a homeless person can't make the walk to City Hall? As Lieutenant Braden said, Malibu's over 19 square miles. What if, as Tish, Tiffany mentioned, that uh, they give up trying to get there and they stop? Are they going to be prosecuted because they didn't get a permit? Or what if when they get there, City Hall isn't open? There are issues with the proposal. That being said, I'm happy to work with you, Council Member Silverstein, to see if we can make it work. Sometimes I have to say no. I try and do it as politely as possible, but I'm more than happy to work with you to try and get something that works with regard to the permit system. And that's not to say that if the council does go in the direction of an ASL, that it couldn't also go in the direction of a permit requirement. So there are ways that we can make this work. Again, we've given some legal advice, noting that that proposal carries with it certain risks. I'm sure in your memo that you, you noted some of those risks yourself. So that being said, the Martin case holds that the Eighth Amendment prohibits the government from criminalizing conduct, namely sleeping outdoors, which would effectively criminalize the status of being homeless. Specifically, so long as there is a greater number of homeless individuals in a jurisdiction than the number of available beds and shelters, the jurisdiction cannot prosecute homeless individuals for involuntarily sitting, lying, or sleeping in public. You've all probably read the Boise decision, know of its impact. It is a very narrow holding. There have been a number of decisions that have come after that have clarified, although there is no case that has held, as uh, Councilmember Silverstein and Councilmember Uring have proposed, that a permit requirement would work. With regard to the ASL proposal, you know, recall that again, Martin doesn't require cities to house their homeless, but if the city insists on pursuing criminal penalties for a violation of its no camping ordinance, it must ensure that a shelter bed is practically available. Remember in Boise that the court found that although there were shelter beds available in three different shelters, there was, there was a religious component that effectively made those beds practically unavailable. So again, as long as there's a greater number of homeless individuals in the jurisdiction than the number of beds, you can't prosecute homeless individuals. Um, a couple of other, other points. Paul mentioned that it would be, um, the ASL proposal would apply a local preference to meet local needs. I know that Costa Mesa and Laguna Beach were able to incorporate that provision, but they were also part of a very high profile settlement agreement with homeless advocates. Um, I believe that was overseen by Judge Carter. My understanding is that agreement provides that the signatories will create shelter beds for 60% of their homeless population in exchange for the ability to afford to enforce their camping ordinances um, without legal challenge from plaintiff's advocacy groups. Um, more importantly, with regard to that provision, the sheriffs have bought in and were part of that settlement or at least bought into the settlement's terms. Other Orange County cities haven't been as fortunate and they have been unable to pull off that requirement and the sheriff has said they will not enforce it absent some form of judicial intervention. But nevertheless, creating a shelter space puts Malibu in a better position to enforce its camping ordinance than it would otherwise be in. Again, the, legal, the legality of any particular criminal enforcement comes down to whether the individual issue had any practical alternative to sleeping outdoors. So this would require law enforcement to confirm that any individual had access to a shelter bed, or that he, she, he or she would be admitted if transported there in real time before arresting him for a violation of the ordinance. So um, the devil is in the details with that proposal. Determining practical availability of shelter beds is critical for enforcing that provision in the ASL and then ultimately your camping ordinance. So those are my comments. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you so much, John, for that. 
All right, at this point, I think it's time for public comments. So I'll be handing the meeting over to uh, Mayor Mikey Pearson to take it from here. Okay, thank you, Susan. I wanna thank all of the speakers so far and um, let's, um, let's have public comment. And I appreciate everyone showing up that, that's here. Thank you very much. We have 31 speakers so far. We'll read them off and then go back to the top. Scott Dietrich, Howard Rudsky, Reverend Paul Elder, Ann Buxy, Bonnie Bolander, Leticia Alloy, Kay Gabbard, Josh Spiegel, Mark Bowdy, Ryan, Daniel Olivo, Annie Germingian, Kelly Pessis, Pamela Conley Ulick, Bert Ross, Joe Patterson, Lori Patterson, Steve Brees, Chris Frost, Krista Windish, Barry Glazer, Bill Sampson, Don Mazza, Lisa Spicer, Lynn Norton, Alexis Aria, Mary Stanley, William Winokur, Stacey Rouse, Melissa Coughlin, and Margo Mendel. So first we'll hear from Scott Dietrich. Hello, Mayor Pearson and Council. Here's a question, what would $30 billion do to help the homeless? Reportedly, that's how much the state gave away to prisoners and other scammers in unemployment payments. What a waste of resources that could have been used to build mental health facilities. Just another reason to recall the governor. But as I thought about that, I realized that it wouldn't have any impact on the homeless problem at all. First, those on the street and in an old RV refuse to give up their lifestyles unless laws are changed and the mentally ill and substance abusers are forced, they will never go into treatment facilities. Why would anyone living near the beach in the best climate in the world want to change? They can panhandle or steal enough money to buy meth, trade it for sex and tents, and the government enables them with food and tents. Hallelujah. Second, most of the money for the homeless problem goes to consultants and others who profit from the homeless industry. If this council wants to see our city go downhill and our environment ruined, we should keep the following policies that currently work so well in Los Angeles. The increase in rapes and shootings and property crimes in Venice due to the homeless being bused there by LA is coming to Malibu, or maybe it's already here. Let's get real. Provide help to those who want to get clean or who've fallen on, <clears throat> excuse me, hard times, especially if they once lived here. But the real solution is to make the druggies so uncomfortable that they move on. 70% of the homeless are from out of state. Put them on a bus home. Hawaii gives them a one-way ticket. It's unfair to expect us to take care of other municipalities' problems. And if we must have an ACL, Put a couple of trailers behind City Hall, 10 beds and a few for the sheriff. Let's see how that works out. Pass the no camping ordinance. Enforce vagrancy laws and laws against littering. Look at the amount of trash the homeless create. Much of it, this will be stolen property and the sheriff can deal with that. Hire another deputy to specifically deal with the homeless. Um, pass a no tent ordinance and a no camp stove and no fires of any kind. Our main safety issue in Malibu is fire. We cannot afford to enable the homeless to burn our homes down. They almost did at Tuna Canyon. We have a moral imperative to prevent them from burning themselves to death as well. We are going to be sued by activists no matter what we do because they profit from the plight of those on the street. So let's take decisive action now before another homeless fire kills somebody. Last, if it's true that LA is already bussing these folks in, we should immediately sue, demanding an injunction. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Next is Howard Resky. Good evening. Hi, Howard. 
First, I'd like to uh, thank Mr. Davis for all the work that he seems to have done. I really had no clue, um, but thank you. And to Sheriff Braden, I think that the carrot and the stick is really difficult here because of what Scott said. If you live on the beach and you really don't have to worry about much, why do you care? So if there could be something very strong fashioned that the sheriff can enforce that Mr. Davis said, and if there's some parts of um, Silverstein's proposition that we didn't get to hear tonight that could be included to make it stronger, let's just do it. Because what Scott said is true. We're going to get sued anyway. You know, it's like it doesn't, it's we're just the spoiled rich people in most people's eyes. And this is a matter of safety. It's just, we've got to do like the sheriff said, take the rights of the homeless, the constitutional rights, excuse me, and balance them with our citizen safety and move on this. And, you know, I, for one, think that we just got to take the bull by the horns and do it. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Next is Paul Elder. Hi. Hi, Paul. I'm the Reverend Paul Elder from St. Aidan's Church, 28211 Pacific Coast Highway. For the last five years, I've been working to help the homeless population in Malibu, including being part of the original uh, Malibu Task Force on Homelessness, which I am very grateful that the city took over after the three years that we were working on that. And I think that this plan that is put before you is an excellent way to go forward for the homeless people for the, and for the city. I endorse its recommendations and the findings in the report. And I urge you to accept it for the reasons that have been outlined. It's a wonderful job by uh, Paul Davis. And uh, I'm glad that you had my friend Gabriel Graham on, he's an old friend. I've known him for five years now. And uh, he has come so far. And he's a great example of what can be done if people are given a chance. He's a wonderful man and I call him my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next is Ann Buxty. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Ann. Okay, good. I just want to support what the, the last speaker just said. I hope we go forward now. I think it's a commonly decent thing to do, and we need to do it now. And I thank everybody for the presentations they've made tonight because it's been very informative to hear what's been going on. And that's... Uh, it, Let's not waste all this effort. Let's let's make use of it and enact the ASL, I think it is. It's not ALS, it's ASL, right? Let's move on that. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Yeah. Next would have been Bonnie Bolander, but we don't see her in the meeting, so we'll look for her later and we'll move on to Leticia Ovalley. Are you there, Leticia? I can. Whoops. I can hear. I can hear you, Leticia. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yes, Hi, okay. everybody. Well, you know, now I'm on the board of the HOA here at Malibu Canyon Village, and most of you know where I stand here. I just want to reiterate. Um, I like what some of the stuff Scott said and Bruce. I don't agree with Paul at all, and he knows that. And. Uh, we don't support a shelter here. I don't believe we have to do it legally. And I don't understand, Susan, why you didn't put up what Beverly Hills does because Beverly Hills handles it without a shelter and they have a clean city over there. 
And I, I don't see why we're not using them as an example. Why, why do we have to subject ourselves to, to having a shelter here at all? And we definitely don't want it on Civic Center. We, we've had enough trouble over here um, for that. So that we're not interested in at all. So I just wanted to say that uh, I'm very well aware of the mental illness out there and the drug issue. And, you know, we are going to still have this problem because as an example today, I don't know if any of you saw next door at Rambla Vista, there's a naked man running around hanging on people's lawns and they said the police have been going over there and you're not going to get him in a shelter. So these things, the fires, this and that, that's not going to stop with the shelter. And also, yes, Scott brought up the busing issue. We're trying to get to the bottom of that. They are busing people in here from Los Angeles. And, and I don't understand why that's happening. And, and we're feeding people. And if we continue to feed people, I guess, behind the post office or something, they're going to continue to come. And, I, and I'm not talking about compassion here. I'm talking about our city and the way it's looking with the trash. I mean, loitering and, and littering used to be illegal. I'm not understanding why we're not, I understand the Ninth Circuit law nonsense, but at least with littering, why aren't we arresting these people and putting them in jail? I agree with Scott on that. I'm sorry. The litter is, is beyond, they filled up underneath the wetland here. Uh, Gabriel was there. He could tell you an entire dump truck of trash that happened within a matter of like, I don't know, three weeks, maybe a month. And this just should, we should enforce that. I had called the police several times about that. And, uh, and Susan did too. So uh, do we get a police force? I thought there was t talk of bringing the police back here to Malibu. That might be an option. Uh, but a shelter is not, I don't believe will help us at all. I just wanted to, to let you all know where we stand here at Malibu County Village. We, we are definitely opposed to it. And we... We will not support that. I, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Next is King Gabbard. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Kay. Hi, uh, this is Kay Gabbard. Thank you for calling this meeting. Thanks to the staff, the city council, um, and everyone for making presentations tonight. I think the more we know, the better decision we'll be able to make. Um, I wanted to, to say that I, I find teeth in the idea that if we have uh, some kind of ASL or something similar, we will then be able to uh, enforce the the laws. That is the laws that we have already in place and that we would deem uh, necessary in the future. I hear our own sheriff saying that. So I think that's important to listen to him. Um, I believe there are people out there who desperately need our help. I think there are people out there who are taking advantage of our city. Um, for obvious reasons. I think it's up to us to discern the difference between the two uh, and act appropriately and compassionately and legally. Uh, being homeless isn't a criminal act, but it's a very slippery slope from losing your job, sleeping in your car, getting so many tickets you can't pay, uh, losing your car, uh, and, and being a criminal because that's how our justice system can deal with you. Um, so I think we have to be very, uh, careful and, and understand that as somebody said, homeless is, it's not a group. It's individual people with individual, uh, concerns. I don't think homelessness is going to end in my lifetime. Um, but I do think it's time that Malibu took it on. And like um, it was said in the Malibu Times a couple of years back, the only way that we're going to make any headway is if every community takes on some part of it. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Kay. Mm -hmm. Next is Josh Siegel. Okay, now you can turn that on if you want. Mm -hmm. Hi, City Council. Thank you for donating your time to our city. Um, I just wanted to come on and um, share a couple thoughts. One thing that I haven't he heard a lot of is uh, treatment. I think that, you know, I spent a little bit of time with Gabe Graham, who's just a really great resource for us. I encourage anyone who hasn't spent any time with him or spoken to him to do so. I mean, it's really interesting perspective and it's a, it's a really good story. So um, basically it's my feeling that the vast majority of these people are some sort of drug or alcohol addiction. And I, I don't think that, that should be overlooked. Um, as far as the letter of agency, one of the problems with the letter of agency is that it, it's only good for one year and um, it's just a pain to get people to fill that, that out. So hopefully we can talk to the sheriff's department and get that extended maybe in perpetuity or 10 years or some longer period of time. And then, um, maybe we could get Ani, um, with, uh, board of realtors to, um, help give that out to new and current homeowners in Malibu. I think that could be a great resource. Um, one thing I, I, I haven't heard how much it's going to cost for what did what did Laguna pay for they for their ASL and how much does it cost to run? Um, in order to sell this to the city of Malibu and the people of Malibu, we're going to have to kind of figure that out and understand what we're going to have to give up in our budget. Um, also, keep in mind that the homeless population in LA County is set to double over the next five years. So. Are, are we going to go from 200 to 400 over five years and then 400 to who knows a thousand 800. So we need to plan for the future, but I would rather plan for the future ourselves and have this be controlled in the city rather than having someone from the state come out here and say, Hey, this is a rich community. We should be able to build to afford a 10 million or $20 million facility. I think that would be ridiculous. Um, you know, that's pretty much all I have. Just a couple of ideas. We're all here to help. We're lucky to have people like Kay in this community. I mean, the sheer workforce that we have, people just willing to volunteer to help our community is astounding. So I, th I think that we as a community need to figure out a way to leverage that into really helping the situation. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. Have a great evening. Thank you, Josh. Next is Mark Bowdy. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Mark. Excellent. Mikey, Karen, Paul, Reva, Yolanda, thank you for serving. Um, let's start with cause and effect. One thing is clear from listening to Deputy Braden and others. We will not get the help we need from the county unless we as a city create an ASL as a transitional measure. And once we do that, we have the capacity to enforce. One of the reasons we can't enforce right now is we don't control our own police force. We contract with the sheriff and the sheriff has informed all of us. The County Board of Supervisors will not allow us to do what we want in terms of enforcement unless we show a more welcoming spirit. Now, as I was looking at this problem and listening over the last eight weeks, I kept wondering to myself, why are these two councilmen trying to force through a proposal that is clearly illegal, unconstitutional, where the deputy is saying we can't enforce it? Uh, our city attorney is saying it's illegal. And I found the answer. It's because the ASL needs to go behind City Hall in the upper parking lot right below Bruce Silverstein and Steve Uring's homes. That's why. Those are council people who will make the entire city get into another lawsuit. We'll have RVs coming back in the summer and we wouldn't have any enforcement capacity. We would just be stuck in another lawsuit. Why? Because Bruce Silverstein and Steve Uring don't want any noise in their backyards. 
I'm a lawyer. I can read the fine print. Bruce's proposal is an evict everyone proposal overnight. And the county has said, if you adopt that proposal, we will bring a sledgehammer down upon you. So let's all understand motive here. Mikey just met with Judge Carter. Paul Davis has a good proposal. Let's get the ASL up and running behind City Hall, upper parking lot, right below Bruce and Steve's homes. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next is Ryan. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the chance to uh, discuss a lot of points, and I'm just going to have to rattle them off because of the short amount of time. Um, if there is to be an ASL in Malibu, there probably needs to be three of them. The city of Malibu created a pot store ordinance and did more than one for the very purpose of not putting a undesirable uh, use next to a residential zone, for instance, and concentrating it. City spent a gazillion dollars on lobbying for uh, anti-concentration of uh, drug treatment facilities in our neighborhoods. And, you know, it, it, this problem isn't all in the Civic Center. In fact, there's very little beach access nearby the Civic Center in the first place. Question is really, uh, should it be considered for the lot near Heather Cliff and Portshead? Should it be considered for Trancas Field? Should it be considered, you know, where the um, parking lot is near the uh, uh, seafood place? There's, a there's too much need and we have too many miles to be concentrating this in a civic center next to a library and other public uses in the most concentrated area of town. So I totally agree. Civic center is not the place and not at the base of a hill that can catch fire. Now you can uh, YouTube a uh, motorhome catch fire and they go up in a matter of, you know, five minutes, they're totally gone. So fire safety is a paramount concern. It really needs to be number one, that no fire ignition um, is ever acceptable for any type of a, a outdoor public camping or parking or overnight facility and at least um, two in Malibu for no nimbyism, and that permits should be required for registration and tracking that this does not become a lifestyle. Permits can be issued by a vending machine just like they are in Santa Monica to park in a parking structure. That technology has existed for 20 years. We need to not fight the real estate market and depress land and property value, we won't be able to create low cost housing here at the beach. It's just not a, it, a possible thing. I hope the real estate uh, uh, commenters will speak to that and certainly Paul Grisanti should know that. There is no such thing. We need to look at short, medium and long-term solutions. Any immediate needs have to be handled through existing programs and acknowledging the non-governmental aid agencies. So uh, I think my time is up. The no sleeping in vehicle was written by our city attorney. So uh, I guess it didn't work out, but we should then recreate a legal form of that. And I, I support the investigation of Silverstein's- Ryan. That's your time. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Submit a letter if you can. Next would have been Daniel Olivo, but I don't see him in the meeting, so we'll come back. And then we'll hear from um, Annie Dermagine. Are you there, Annie? in the meeting, but I don't know that she's at her device. Do you want to move on and we'll circle back? Uh, certainly. So next we'll hear from Kelly Pesses. Okay. Here I am. Oh, wait. Wait, who do we have? Is that Kelly or no, Annie? No, it's Annie. Oh, I, I I'm am. Sorry, I, I 
stories. Go ahead. Okay, I wanted to report the incident that had happened to me on the 19th. Um, basically, um, it was in the Malibu Times, for those of you that um, uh, had a chance to read, I'll be really brief and tell you, it was um, an incident that happened to me and to another realtor that shook us up for at least three to four days thereafter, um, just pouring gas and um, homeless um, was approaching me and asking for cash or money because he said he was starving and he said it over and over and over. And then when I finished pouring my gas, I decided to go into the liquor store and actually buy him lunch sandwiches and um, uh, chips and a bottle of Coke. And I approached him and I put the bag in front of him. He turned around and he started cursing and yelling and um, really scary. And as I turned around, I saw him throwing the chip, the bag of chips on my car. Um, lucky me, there was another realtor that was pouring gas that I didn't even recognize uh, since both of us were wearing masks. Um, he stepped in and asked the homeless to step back and, um, and, and watch what he was saying to me. He then uh, approached my car and said he wanted a ride and not food. Um, he started throwing a bottle of um, Coke on my hand really aggressively um, and really trying to push himself to come into my car. So had Madison not been there, I don't know what I would have done. It was a very, very scary moment for me. Um, I was just trying to help and give food. Of course, I would never um, give money, never. Um, anyways, I did take off but I was really shook, shooken up as to what would have happened to me if I didn't have my angel there to watch. Um, that's that. And I really hope the city um, and the Malibu Association of Realtors together and other organizations can come up with a great plan where we can um, find solutions for this. Thank you, Ani, and I'm glad you're okay. Thank you, and thank you for you and Karen for reaching out. It really meant a lot to me. Um, so we'll go back to Kelly now. Hi, can you guys hear me? I can hear you, Kelly. Yay. Okay. Yay. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, also, if I go a little bit over, Steve Brace is here with me and will give me some time. Is that okay? How, how long are you looking for? Like four minutes. Okay, and Steve is, uh, okay, sure, go for okay. it. Yeah, you have my time. Okay, thanks. Um, first, I want to th thank <clears throat> Paul Davies, uh, Susan Duenas K, Gabriel, and to all that I've had the pleasure of working with in the Homeless Working Group. We do need beds, but in addition to the two options that are on the table, I think we have other options. And I think we need to triage our homeless so that they can be placed in appropriate situations. This will give them a better chance for success and it will mean a better program, a successful program for, for Malibu. If we have partnerships with beds, with multiple cities like our COG, we can do a better job. Our own attorney, city attorney said tonight that you can't criminalize conduct, meaning that there's nothing we can do if an individual is acting out and doesn't meet the threshold of legal of a legal offense or a 5150 mental hold. And we just heard from Ani, her instance, um, there are lots of them. And my question is, if Martin B. Boise doesn't require a shelter in our city, why don't we look at other options like a joint effort for complete services and beds? Regrettably, regrettably, I oppose the current plan from the city for the Civic Center, as I do not think simply having an ASL will truly mitigate our homeless problem, and certainly not in the city of town, I mean the center of town. The impact of the service resistant population that remains here in Malibu is creating intense pressure on businesses, residents, and parents. As a recent, at a recent board meeting, we had several members telling of their personal stories, stories of violent attacks, of children being sexually accosted by vagrants, and this was recently, like within a week. 
This mirrors my very own personal story for my family. We discuss how incidents like this are becoming more frequent and are being more, and even though they're being properly reported, there seems to be this revolving door of the same bad acting individuals that are arrested and right back in our community within days. We all see individuals suffering from mental illness, open wounds, addictions, and other ailments, and they're not getting help. And they're probably not getting help because the homeless healthcare system is broken. But I don't think we as a population of 10,000 can fix the entire system. These problems predate Martin V. Boise, and they also predate the new district attorney, George Gascon. I, I agree wholeheartedly that these are I, things that have been going on for a very, very long time. Our burgeoning homeless population is likely a result of mental health and prison reform and a lack of mental health facilities. We are seeing an ever growing population of people who do not want help and we can't force them. In 2008, just a, a joint effort was created between Culver City and Beverly Hills. It's called Upward Bound House and it's a converted motel in Culver City that was purchased by the County of Los Angeles, the um, uh, I forget the agency, Los Angeles City, a private individual, and the City of Beverly Hills. And it's for use by the uh, City of Beverly Hills and Culver City. And by the way, the City of Beverly Hills only had to pay $200,000. Now, I'm sure they're paying funds to keep the housed unit uh, people continually housed, but the key money or buy-in was really low. And there are many other examples. So my question tonight is why can't Malibu do the same? Please focus the discussion tonight on funding a joint shelter operation and defining location, a location that's conducive to the needs of the homeless. They're the ones we're trying to serve. They need a shelter that is near services and transit hubs. We Hello. don't, yeah. That's your four minutes. I'm sorry? That's your four minutes. Well, Steve was yielding me. Oh, I only have four. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kelly. Next, we'll hear from Pamela Kalmiulik. Okay. Good evening, and thank you so much, Malibu City Council and all the speakers. Uh, my name is Pamela Kalmiulik. I got involved in this issue way back when uh, with I'd like to thank Carol Moss. I'd like to thank Sandy Little. They really started with this whole getting together as a community to deal with this issue. And I wanna remind everyone what Harry Truman once said, which was society will be judged by how it treats its weakest members. And this issue is about people who are at the most vulnerable places in their life. I truly believe that a lot of these people who are homeless don't want to be there. And but for the grace of God, there goes I. And I've had so many instances living in Malibu of, with homeless that I, 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 I can't even begin right now. But I do know we did help a few people. Um, I want to thank the city because it took this on way back in 2018 after a group of us. And Paul Elder was there. Thank you, Paul, Burt Ross. Um, all the other people who contributed to get the city to kind of get the outreach workers, the professionals who know how to help these people get not just housing, but wraparound services. Like many of you said, they're mentally ill, they're addicted, or just can't get a job and they need help with a resume. Um, I'm really grateful for all of you uh, tonight who have just poured your heart and soul into this. Um, I think ASL is maybe not the um, answer, but it's a start. Just like when we started in 2016, we didn't know if we could hire OPCC to come and have professionals, you know, social workers in Malibu, but we did it. And it was a start. And I heard tonight, since then, it was 130 people we've got off the street. So I'm grateful that the city is taking another giant step forward tonight. And I'm, Malibu is better than Mount Beverly Hills, in my opinion. Malibu has heart, we have soul, we have compassion, and we are going to address this issue the best we can. And tonight you're taking that huge leap forward with this proposal. And Bruce, and I hope you will join in and 
it's going to be to be continued. It's not the perfect solution, but it's a start. And we're going to need every single person on the city council working on this and every one of us in Malibu giving you feedback. And Ani, I'm so sorry what happened to you. Um, and we don't want that to happen. So we do need to balance public safety with compassion to come up with a solution. And tonight is a, a, a giant step towards that. So thank you all so much. I'm so grateful for all of you. And um, let's hope this is just the beginning. Thank you, Pamela. Next, we'll hear from Bert Ross. Uh, our public safety manager, Susan Duenas, Paul Davis, and the City of Malibu Homelessness Working Group for this extremely well thought out proposal for an alternative sleeping location. This proposal accomplishes two things simultaneously. One, it addresses a crying need for humanitarian assistance by providing shelter for many of our people now living on the street. And two, by providing shelter it allows our sheriff's department to legally clear out encampments, which currently represent a major fire danger. Thank you for your efforts and let's work together to make this proposal a reality. Let's do something constructive. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Next is Joe Patterson. Uh, good evening, city council and staff. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Joe. Okay, great. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for calling the special meeting to discuss the issues of homelessness in our city. The issue is so vitally important to the health, safety, and well-being of our community and residents, both housed and unhoused. Your commitment and perseverance to finding solutions is very much appreciated. I would like to start by stating that I believe that the county's interpretation and, and directives regarding Martin v. Boise decision are way off base and erroneous. That being said, I would like to know how much effort or consideration by our city was given to challenging the county district attorney in their directive to the LA County sheriffs to not cite illegal campers either outside or in vehicles going against our city's own ordinance adopted lawfully nearly two decades ago. We are all very aware that the majority of RV campers are not indigent homeless individuals with no other options than to park indefinitely beachfront on PCH. The fact that our city has had to waste precious time and funds jumping over hurdle after hurdle to implement additional restricted parking rules, signage, and ordinances simply to deal with hundreds of people and vehicles gaming the system because the county gave them a free pass is a travesty. That time, effort, and money could have been used much more productively to help and find solutions for our truly in need unhoused individuals. And the fact that you on city council did not recognize that and aggressively challenged the county is almost criminal in my mind. How many years has, have been spent dealing with this specific issue to have only recently been able to implement the complex workarounds needed to clean up PCH and when exactly do you anticipate being able to enforce the newest oversized vehicle parking ordinance. I hope that tonight you will be able to share and discuss specific details about the proposed alternative sleeping locations and safe parking operations. How many beds and or parking spaces do you anticipate needing to adequately, adequately service our homeless population? Based on examples given in your report for the cities of Laguna and Ventura, I would estimate no more than a dozen of each would be needed based on the relative population of those cities compared to ours. Since Zuma Tower 13 was clearly rejected by the residents as an appropriate location for safe parking, what has the city done to, since to identify other locations? Why did the county only identify one out of four possible locations as being suitable? Um, now I would like to just pass the baton uh, to my wife, uh, Lori, if that's all right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Joe. Hello. Can I, you hear me? I can hear you, but there's some sort of reverb. How about now? That I think it's better. Thanks, Lori. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't hear them. I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm going to just continue on with what Joe was saying. 
in uh, the report, I would argue that we, we see since 2017, there has actually been a downward trend in homeless individuals in our city. With the exception of 2020 as an anomaly, if you separate those in and out of vehicles, we see the following trend. 2017, outside 121, in vehicles 57. 2018, 100 outside, 55 in vehicles. 2019, 61 outside, 93 in vehicles. 2020, there was a spike, 107 outside and 132 in vehicles. In 2021, uh, 85 outside and 72 in vehicles. The report also states that since 2018, Malibu's outreach team has moved 136 individuals off the street. And I'd say that's pretty good record and effort considering that in any given month, Malibu outreach reports 40 to 60 individuals on the streets, more than half of which are considered engaged, meaning that they are interested in receiving services towards permanent housing. I think a lot of California cities would love to report such optimistic statistics, so congratulations. So given that if our numbers are trending downward, if you separate the truly unhoused from the opportunistic RV dwellers, we are consistently able to help individuals off the street and in, in temporary or permanent housing. And we have jumped through the necessary hoops to implement parking ordinances to drastically reduce illegal and opportunistic camping. Why at this point is there still a push to establish alternative sleeping and safe parking lots? How many vehicle dwellers have been assaulted while spending the night on PCH that would benefit from safe parking in our city? How many unhoused individuals sleeping outdoors would qualify and potentially use an ASL site? Would our efforts and resources as a city be better put to use by fortifying and supporting the programs already in place to assist even more individuals off the street and into temporary or permanent housing than trying to grandly expand our efforts into providing potential unneeded and underutilized ASLs or safe parking programs that will no doubt be very contentious, very expensive and very un underutilized. While I agree that exploring and pursuing some type of emergency or temporary housing options within our city is a noble cause, I believe that like School separation and their short-term housing ordinances, this will be a long and arduous process with no conclusion in the near future. I implore you to give serious consideration to an adopting some form of the amended no camping ordinance proposed by council member Uring and Silverstein in order to give our city and the LA County sheriffs the tools they need to lawfully deal with illegal camping in the short term. Because I disagree with all of you who wanna use the model for Laguna Ventura and Redondo Beach. We're not like them in a critical way. We do not have our own police force, which is what makes those models work. It will not work here, which is why our sheriffs need every tool in their arsenal we can give them. Surely such an amendment can be vetted, adopted quickly, bringing immediate benefit to the health, welfare, and safety of our community. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lori. <laughs> you, can, you can breathe now. <laughs> Next is Chris Frost. Good evening, council members and staff. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of those who have worked on this homeless plan for the past several years, especially those that have been on that advisory committee. And uh, kind of a special shout out to Paul and Susan for what they've laid out, but also want to thank Kay, Terry, Gabriel Graham, Mike Trinan, Alex Gittinger, Scott Edens, and numerous others for all the work that they've done. I've been lucky enough to sit beside them and watch what these people have brought to the table. And I'm, it's never a failure to be impressed by, by what I see. A lot of smart people there. Many of us spent a day in the city of Laguna Beach last year and were able to view and discuss a successful shelter operation. We looked at their shelter known as an alternative sleeping location or ASL and we met with their city manager, their mayor, public works director, chief of police, quite a few others. We discussed all the elements that got them to the point they were at, but they didn't get to that point until they were sued and it cost them millions of dollars. They have a successful, well-run program. Let's not also get to the point where our hand is forced. Let's do it on our own terms. There will come a time in the not too distant future when somewhere in government, someone's going to say, your time is up city of Malibu, what's your plan? And if you don't have a plan, they're going to give us one. It would be much better to get ahead of this and execute a plan of our choosing and sooner in this case would be preferable to later. Also, whoever it was that was a couple speakers back was addressing the over oversized ordinance. That ordinance is gonna be rolled out and be effective in the next, I would say in the next week. So um, I think that's gonna make a big difference. Um, it's another tool in the toolbox. 
So um, thank you for everybody that helped get that off the ground as well. And good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next is Crystal Windish. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, Krista. Thank you. Uh, I just want to start off by saying thank you for everyone at this meeting today and thank you for the city council. Um, and especially thank you for Susan for reaching out and speaking with me the other day. Um, I'm coming at this from a very different angle in that uh, my family, we have, um, my brother is homeless in Malibu. And I wanna share with you that it is, it is, it's beyond imaginably difficult on all of us. And we grew up here in Agora Hills. And at one time um, he was married, had several kids, owned several homes. And it's a very complex situation, but ultimately I think like most people on the streets struggle with mental illness. And I want to let you all know that I appreciate everything that you are doing to help the homeless community. I think that um, there's been so many wonderful people on tonight that have addressed the sense of humanity that I appreciate so much. Um, Father Paul in particular is someone that has been close to me and has taken the time to call me and let me know my brother is okay. Um, I, I, I really don't know what the solution to this problem is because clearly I'm struggling it very close to home. Um, I do know though that when people have reached out to him and have talked to him and, and have given him an opportunity to tell his story, I know that it moves him and I know that it moves him in a direction that we need him to go in to be healthy. Um, I think that what Gabriel said in his story is just such an example of how what is happening and the help that people are giving the homeless um, is, is, is instrumental in, in leading people to um, live a happier and healthier life. So really, I just wanted to come on tonight and let you know that um, this is a really personal issue for my family and I, and these are people, these are, these are people that at one time they were like that. Yes. Sorry, your time is up. Okay. Thank you for sharing your story, Krista. Uh, next would have been Barry Glazer, but I don't see that person in the meeting. Okay. So, Bill Sampson is our next speaker. Bill. Am I on? I can hear you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, first, um, a few speakers back some guy who made specious uh, accusations. Uh, I guess he just forgot to thank Bruce and Steve for their uh, service. I think the rest of you were thanked. Uh, so guys, I want to thank you. Uh, I, and I'm quite moved by the uh, last speaker. I was homeless for about two months in 1972. I lived in a 1949 GMC panel. Uh, I wanted to move it around. The trouble was I had to hang my head out the window because the exhaust uh, leaks were so bad. Um, and I'm sure, had I come to Malibu, 
no one would have wanted me here. Um, that was true everywhere I went. Uh, things have improved somewhat since then. Um, and I'm happy to say I was just plain lucky. Uh, the problem that exists uh, is not a Malibu problem. It's a national problem. We have completely failed nationally to take care of this problem. I, and it's just not going to work bottom up. Uh, that said, um, I was not complete. I'm, I'm still not completely familiar with um, Paul Davis's suggestions. Some of them have merit. Um, I've read Bruce's. It has more merit to my thinking. Uh, the camping ordinance, particularly since, as the Patterson so eloquently stated, an awful lot of these people are not drug addict, impoverished, homeless people. They're people who want to live in their RVs by the beach. Um, I think if I had known Malibu existed in 1972, I'd have tried to get that 49 panel out here. I probably would have had to push it. Uh, but I had to come out here and I lived in the panel out there at Zuma. Um, you need to do something, I think, a little tougher than what Paul was talking about. I hope you will give uh, Bruce's uh, proposal very serious consideration. I know he's put a lot of work into it. I know he has also consulted with uh, Jim Braden's, uh, I guess his boss, the captain over there. Um, it's Becerra. I, I can't roll my R's properly. Uh, so I'm not trying to insult him. I'm just trying to say his name. Um, problem around here is that the three of you, Karen, Mikey, and Paul, something that Bruce says and the 2,400 of us that voted for him and for Steve, he and we are treated like a mushroom. You shove us all into a dark, hot room, shut the door. It stays dark. Once in a month, you throw manure on us. Pay attention to him. He's got some good ideas. Not all of them are good, but you're just shutting him out. Quit it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next is John Mazza. Okay. Okay, I'm unmuted. I have to be very quick, but in order for this to work, you need to bring in the community and have have more consensus than. 10, 20, 30 people. You can't walk into a meeting and say, we've got the solution, here it is, not tell us how much it's gonna cost. Now, first, it's obvious to everybody in Malibu that your count's wrong. We haven't had, we don't have less homeless than three years ago, we have more. We have increasing crime, it's very obvious on Point Doom, very obvious, people are afraid. More and more people are hiring private police in the last 30 days, both gullies on either side of me have had people living in them. Fortunately, we got them out of there, but we burned down two years ago. We need to, we need safety. So you need consensus. I've had a house in Laguna Beach for 45 years. I understand Laguna Beach. They are different. One of the things they have is they separate their ASL from residential areas. It's by itself and it gives people a little bit of peace. Now, uh, our city attorney said we need 60% coverage. That's 100 beds, not 30. It's 95 beds plus five police beds, okay, out of 157. And what you have to consider is we've had a moratorium on rent for over a year and a half, or over a year, and it's continued until next August, this August. We also have a moratorium on mortgage payments. All that is coming due very quickly. A large portion of those people are going to be out of their houses and they're going to be homeless, a large portion of them. We have to plan for a surge. It's, it's coming and everybody knows it. Now, I have to have, thank Kelly Priestess for thinking out of the box. If we can go to another city, have a joint venture, fine. But to have an ASL, not have buy-in by the, the city people, uh, the average citizen, and have three councilmen decide where it's going to be and what it's going to be, will get a public reaction. Maybe we can get FEMA trailers and rent them, but anything that's permanent will stay permanent. That's how bureaucracies work. And 
we we need a buy-in. We need a solution, and it's not having a meeting where twenty people decide what the solution is. And you have to present where, when, and how, and how much to the general public and educate them, or this will be closed down after next election. And you have to tell us how much. We're already using library funds to pay two hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year to guard just the library. Okay, so we need to know, and we need public buy-in on this. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next would be Lisa Spicer, but I do not see her in the meeting. Okay. So we will move on to Lynn Morton. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, Lynn. Okay. So um, I have a few comments and a question. Um, one comment is that I agree we need to have a solution to this before the state comes in and imposes a solution. Uh, but also, we can't solve it and create another problem at the same time. And uh, one thing about a uh, homeless shelter is I don't think that we can put a shelter near somebody's neighbor, near a neighborhood where you're taking, right now the problem is spread out throughout the city and then all of a sudden we're going to congregate the whole issue of homelessness into essentially any one neighborhood in Malibu. So I don't know, I don't have the answer, but I'm just saying that you have to look at holistically at everything. And, um, you know, I don't know if we could put tiny houses up in a property in the hill that we lease. I don't know, that's a brainstorming thought, maybe it's a bad thought, but we can't solve one problem and create another one. Um, another thing is that um, John Cotty mentioned about in the Laguna lawsuit where they're having to keep 60% of the homeless people in shelters. And he said that in answer to a comment about giving sort of preferential people to uh, treatment to people who were once part of the Malibu community. And I think that, you know, I think we would have to be willing to, at, at some point, even to litigate that, because I think we have to be able to give preferential treatment to people who live in Malibu. Because when I think of this, um, it's like if we got a bunch of people and help them into a shelter. What I'm wondering is what about the other people? What about the people who refuse to go into a shelter or who are too dangerous in some people's mind to, to share a shelter? Or what about people who are willing to go into a shelter but they don't want any help beyond that, they wanna live in a shelter forever. And then if you can't limit that to people who were in Malibu, then anybody could come and want to be in the shelter. So here's my here's my one question and, and please, um, you guys on the city council, make sure, please make sure somebody answers this. I think that the right person to answer it is Lieutenant Braden, but my question is that multiple people have said that if we have an ASL, then we can enforce the no camping ordinance. So what I'm wondering is what does that enforcement look like? You come across somebody who's homeless and you tell them there's a bed available and they say, no, I don't want it. And then what happens? You say, oh, you're being bad and that's the end of it or can you get that person out of the city or can you not actually do anything? What does enforcement look like at that point? Please get that question answered because I've asked it a few times before and I've never gotten an answer to that. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Next is Alexis Arden. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Alexis. Hi, everyone. I think that most people, most people here believe in a humanistic approach and a vision for the greater good. Um, I volunteered for the homeless in Malibu from 2003 until 2007, until I was, you know, experiencing issues because I was living on PCH, um, you know, with them following me and showing up at my home. Uh, and I have been doing quantitative and qualitative research this past year. Um, I heard what Mr. Mark Bauty said. Mr. Bauty, um, Bruce and Steve are not objecting to the Central Malibu shelter for selfish reasons. The actual reason is that an overwhelming number of Malibu residents have petitioned Bruce to take seriously the issue of violence against women. Last year, there was a break-in and sexual assault a few hundred feet 
from the city hall. Um, so let's stop name calling. Mr. Bauti, I hope you know that violence against women is a blight to the society and a human rights violation. Um, it is vital to understand the issue of violence against women by the homeless. Um, the homeless population might decline drastically if one factor is put at place. If we do a psychological assessment on the homeless and transfer those who need psychiatric or psychological help to the appropriate facilities. We need a traveling professional who will perform psychological assessments. Um, we cannot force the general public to deal with 5150 situations um, on a daily basis. And this is the current situation in Malibu. It's best not to allow anyone living off grid. Um, there was a report um, that sheriff uh, responded to a call in the wee hours of the morning uh, from a, uh, by a female um, La Costa resident. There was a homeless man standing outside her bedroom window. He had several warrants in other states. So um, one observation about the homeless in Malibu is that um, if we want to do um, um, a shelter, well, definitely it has to have a security guard. It has to be uh, not, it, it has to not allow vagrant behavior um, in at night. And um, it needs to be away from a highly populated area. Central Malibu is the most concentrated populated area in Malibu. And I live there and I I know this area really well, so let's be realistic about this issue. And um, I don't know if we're going to build a share station, but I know it would be out of the box, but maybe one 11th hour resource would be to um, have some homeless who need desperate are desperate for shelter to put them at jail cells. But again, it might be out of the box. I don't know. Um, that's yes, I'm done. Done. Thank okay. you. I'm done. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Next would have been Mary Stanley, but I don't see her in the meeting. Okay. So we'll move on to William Winifred. Are you there, Bill? He was in the meeting and it looks like, oh, maybe there. Did you find him? Hello, oh, may, I, I, may I start? May I, I, can, start? I can hear you now, Bill, I can hear you. Oh, I apologize. Okay, so, no um, sorry. Okay, let me start. So, uh, first of all, uh, on Paul Davis's uh, presentation, that was a, a fantastic presentation, Paul. Uh, it sure sounds uh, excellent on paper if it could work as envisioned, but it does open the door to several key questions that I think deserve to be addressed. Number one, you refer to uh, uh, prioritizing people with a Malibu connection. Well, that's a very vague thing. What does Malibu connection mean? If I make it here from Wisconsin or Skid Row, if I'm here for 30 days, am I connected? One year, two years? If I can hide in the bushes for three years, does that make me Malibu connected? I think it's a, I think it's an important uh, issue to ascertain what does that established connection mean. Two, it would it be acceptable to uh, have a program that expects uh, participants to um, work uh, uh, somewhat, work for in exchange for having food and shelter. Three, where to put it. Obviously, no neighborhood wants it, but you will find greater acceptance if it is farthest from residential and the retail center of, of Malibu. Next, um, well, what if someone's behavior gets them banned, so to speak? Uh, then, sure, sure, deputy, the A for. Make it proud to that. Um, next, 
Kay Gabbard said that our should uh, participate proportionately. That's fine. How many is proportionate? 20, 50, 100, 1,000? Can we cap the number eventually? How do we cap the length of stays? And let me just finish up uh, by saying, I believe that the city has an absolute obligation to consider the unified approach first, i.e. the possibility of teaming up with uh, you know, with a, an adjacent municipality that has far more resources, existing uh, ability to deal with uh, homeless shelters, have their own police forces, uh, better medical facilities, hospitals, outreach, et cetera. I think that should be the first priority. Uh, and if that is exhausted and that does not work and it does not solve our issues of being able to allow the sheriffs to properly enforce. Um, then secondarily, I think the ASL needs to be, would, would be certainly an option. And I know that besides the Beverly Hills and Culver City uh, example, I think there's another effort up in, uh, I think it's Chatsworth uh, as well. So there is precedence for, for this. William, and, that, yeah. that's your time. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. Next would have been Stacy Rouse. I cannot see her name anymore. Okay. So we'll move on to Marissa Coughlin. Okay. Hello, council members. Hi, Marissa. Um, I think the issue of the homelessness uh, is a head and a heart issue. It's also a circumstance and a desire issue. As some of the speakers reference the motorhomes and such, I've been arguing with the Coastal Commission. And I had indicated to them um, that uh, when they were acquiring a 20 foot view corridor on a lot on the beach, and yet they let the motorhomes who all had cars, by the way, and I've had discussions with 128 quote homeless individuals uh, with motorhomes and uh, vehicles. They say that they like to be there. They don't have to have any encumbrances as the rest of us do, our property taxes and such. Uh, the camps, I don't think, are, are viable. Also, the, the homeless individuals who have the uh, circumstance type uh, homelessness, drugs, alcohol, et cetera, uh, they're not going to want to come to us and register for anything. They, they want to live their life, and they don't want to be involved with us. Yet some of the people who have uh, motor homes and some of them who do live in the bushes, one gentleman, I mentioned this at a previous meeting, gets $1,000 a week off his Platinum American Express card. And I thought he was helping his homeless peers. And he used language on me, which I won't repeat, and told me to butt out. Uh, their self-acknowledgement, as Mr. Uh, uh, Graham had said, is the critical first step. If there's some way that we could have a facility on a temporary basis with all of the underlying uh, requirements for medical and a review and a mental review uh, and then give them the choice, do they want to participate or not? If they don't want to participate, possibly then the law, law enforcement can have an avenue by which they t tell them they can't hang out. If they want to self-help, then that gives them a choice. Um, the vehicles uh, that are we're having the problem with now uh, there are people who, uh, gentlemen who are taking pictures of little kids on the beach when their mothers are chained to getting the sand off them and such. And the Sheriff's Department has several incidences and including what I said about them dumping their uh, gray, white, and black water down the storm drains on PCH and into the ocean. Um, the rules have to apply to everybody. If we have to give them help to help them get there, people like Mr. Graham and, and the uh, pastors and, and uh, of the churches can be of great assistance in that regard, but I really think it's uh, it's important that uh, we delineate the time, cost, and uh, retention of this process. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. And last one here from Marco Munda. Thank you. Hello, council members. 
Hi, Margo. I was not actually planning on speaking tonight, but this uh, issue is probably one of the most important issues the world over. Uh, anyway, I, I just, and here I am the caboose, so I, I just wanted to bring three points uh, to everybody's attention. I uh, look at this problem uh, threefold. It's if you go to a, a good doctor, they go after the problem and not the symptom. I was a lifelong educator in the elementary school system. And I see this problem mirroring what happened in our school system. Uh, there are those kids who need resource specialists. And there are those kids who need special ed. It is very rare that a special ed individual gets mainstream back into the school setting. A resource specialist is somebody who works with kids who can function within the mainstreamed environment of the uh, school, the main uh, school system, uh, but needs help on the side. And ultimately, the way you handle children who have uh, made a bad decision is you need to make them understand that they have a choice. So like what Marissa just said is that if you don't give these individuals who are flagrant in what they do a choice, and they are mentally capable of making a choice, uh, the choice has to be enforced, uh, whether it's one or the other. Um, I, I just, uh, otherwise the symptom is gonna persist and the problem will never be dealt with. And those are the points I wanted to make. Thank you very much, Margo. All the speakers that we didn't get to earlier are still not in the meeting, so that concludes public comment. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Um, so we're back here at the council. I wanna thank, just as in general, all the public speakers really appreciate everyone showing up. Um, a lot of great comments, a lot of great input, and um, now it's uh, time for comments from city councilors. Um, Glad to have someone start or all start. It's up to you guys. Steve, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I'd like I, I would also like to thank all the speakers. I learned a lot. I've got a couple questions on the the uh, Paul Davis your uh, shelter. Have you put in cost numbers around this in terms of what it would cost to do that? Uh, yeah, we've we've uh, we've looked at the cost of, of running the Laguna the Laguna shelter, um, and uh, you know found it to be actually pretty affordable. The the, um, the largest cost, of course, is is, is people. Um, you would need uh, two people at all times uh, to be there, um, and you know, and you would have a program director, a clinical case manager, a case manager, a housing coordinator. Um, so essentially, it'd be 12 FTEs, and so you can you can factor that out with human costs, um, and then uh, and then just the basics of of, of running a, a modular uh, unit, not too large, and so relatively affordable. What's relatively affordable mean? You get a number? Yeah, it it could be done in the neighborhood of six hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. Uh... It could be done less or more, depending on you know whether you want to add or or reduce the number of people involved. When you look at the number of the homeless population, do you have any idea of the number of that population of, are, are are made up of people who actually live in Malibu or came from Malibu? I mean, what kind of a number are we looking at for Malibu residents we want to take care of? Any idea? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. I might, I might actually turn out that I went over to, uh, to Tiffany Stewart. Is Tiffany, if you're able to, to address that. Okay, Tiffany. Um, I don't have, I can't give an exact number. Um, 
of people, I can't really accurately answer that question. I have encountered some people that have told me that they were from Malibu and and um, and have, were, grew up there. Or we do know that we have housed a couple of people that that lost their homes in the fire. But I can't give an exact number. No. Yeah, I'm just trying to get back to one of the the, the components of Paul's plan was taking care of Malibu residents. I'm just sort of trying to get my head around how many of those there may be. I, and, and let me ask the question, I think it was John Cotty that brought it up. How, the number of beds we're gonna have to have, and I, and I well, I, I guess it's a two part question. Well, let's give the number of beds first. I do believe, I think it was John Mazza that mentioned that the population is gonna grow, okay? And I don't know whether it's gonna double, triple, who the heck knows. I also, I, I, I hiked through Legacy Park uh, every, almost every day uh, in front of the labor exchange. Uh, and I talked to people who live down in Zuma who are uh, jogging through the tunnel down there. And I, I do believe the, the homeless population in Malibu has increased versus going down. But let's assume it's you know 200 people today and a year from now when this rental moratorium disappears, it grows to 400. How many beds are we going to have to have? What what are they going to what are they going to require us to have in terms of the number of beds to take care of that population? Do we know? Do we have an idea? We may not know, but just something we're think we got to think ahead about. The issue isn't how many beds you need. The issue is whether you can prosecute someone if you don't have that space, right? So it might be that you have ten homeless people in your on any given night. In that situation, you need ten beds. You know, if you have and, you know, again, that's... Let's say I get let's say I get 400 homeless people in Malibu a year from now. How many beds do I have to have? Well, in theory, you would need 400 practically available beds. So, you know, there's a bit of a settlement in Orange County that, that negotiated that number downward. I can let you know, Paul, Mike, or some of the people that are meeting with with the judge in Orange County can can discuss that. But the settlement greatly lowered that number in exchange for. Um, essentially not being sued by homeless advocates group, homeless advocate groups. Okay. Paul, you were going to say something? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of the chicken and the egg here. You know, you, uh, the ASL is there for folks that are, are willing, you know, we want to focus our resources on the people that actually want to make their lives better. The folks that are here now that take advantage, you know, we don't, we don't need to focus our resources there. Um, so if they're willing to to work toward a sustainable housing plan, we can put them in the ASL. The rest of the, uh, of those folks won't be allowed to camp here. And so you're already getting you're already sort of dividing the group up and and reducing the population just based on the number of people that are actually willing and wanting to work towards a sustainable housing solution. So that takes the number down. Um, and I think that's one one thing that's that's really important to. Uh, to, to keep in mind. The second thing is what's been mentioned here. There's a number of things that need to need, need to happen. This isn't the only solution. There are there are things that need to be happening uh, preventatively. Uh, there are things that need need to be happening from from a number of different uh, um, perspectives to, to to reduce this. But once we have an ASL and we can start uh, helping people to get back on their feet and sort of reducing the inflow, or excuse me, once you know sort of getting people back into uh, in, in, in the housing and reducing the numbers, then you can sort of get that, that population down and down and down, uh, you know, and-, and uh, I'm, and I'm just looking at it in terms of, you know, like project creep, all right? I mean, once, if we get it set up and the number of homeless people increase, what do we have to do? Uh, if I can't get them into a shelter, do I, is somebody gonna come and say, you gotta put up additional shelters? So my, my point, I guess, is if, if you're gonna go down that route, I think we got to give the residents a real clear picture of not only what you want to do to start it off, but what it could become a year from today or two years from today. So at least they know what we're getting into. Because you go back to the thing that says, you know, I, I run it as a pilot and I like pilots. I think pilot projects are the way to go. I don't think I've ever heard of a pilot project on homeless that got started that somebody turned around and shut it down. I mean, once it's there, it becomes institutionalized and you're likely to make it grow versus making it smaller. That's just one man's perspective. Uh, one last question, I wanna to get to Lynn Norton's question, or two questions, I guess. Lynn Norton's enforcement. What does enforcement look like? 
how does enforcement work? I got a shelter with 40 beds. I think your number was 30 to 40, whatever the hell the number was. And I got another 120 homeless people sitting around Malibu. How does, what it happens? How does that whole process take place? Uh, Councilman, you're in violations of the camping ordinance as it currently is constituted, constituted misdemeanor. So you, there's criminal liability penalties for. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, is the sheriff uh, going to drive up, pick them up and drive them to the edge of the town and say. Well, that's more of an enforcement question that I'll let Lieutenant Braden. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how that works. I mean, is, is Lieutenant Braden, you still with us? You working down there. Yeah, I can comment on that. Okay. Actually, that section, it was it was used for years in Malibu. It's actually very effective until we were told by the district attorney's office not to use it. So it was used to limit the amount of people sleeping in the parks, people sleeping around Malibu for years. So it's not like it. But I understand your concerns with it. And I don't think, like I commented earlier, there's not some perfect answer to it and i i can't promise that oh a shelter wouldn't grow in nature but at the same time like some of the stipulations of like who would be entering that program um how it would allow us like in legacy park or like up around ralph's or even down through zuma beach area to literally move along people that they're not allowed to camp there. So, I mean, can we still be sued? Yeah, we still could be sued, I guess. But the uh, at the same time, we're trying to suffice, we're trying to provide something and at the same time, preserve the community and also like even in Bruce's plan to protect the community uh from fires from thefts from all kinds of things that's the most important part here and that's that's the uh, like listening to the public comments everybody has their points and but the only thing about it is if nothing's done about it everything just continues on and i look i'm not i'm not advocating doing nothing i'm just trying to yeah. you know get a perspective of whatever path we go down what does it look like yeah in in I mean, just like when you mentioned the size or anything else, I mean, like uh, Paul said, that that's what we would be providing. And I, I don't know. I don't see it blowing up in size. That's what we would try out. I, I don't know if I don't know if that's the perfect answer for Malibu. All I know is some of the things that exist, just like Bruce is concerned about people lighting fires up in the hills. I have those same concerns, but I, I'm trying to work through my mind how I can send my people out and like forcibly remove people. Oh no, your opening it, comment talking about having owners, owners responsible for the property. I've got that down as a major note. That, that's, I agree with you. All right. Uh, because, because us being responsible for the security of someone's property, people that have houses are on their properties and we get calls from them when there's issues right. with people property. These properties that are left, they're appreciating in value, most of them, and but they're just sat there, and um, it allows they have to be checked. And, and like I said, it's way beyond the sheriff's department checking. Oh, no, 90 I, I agree with you 100. percent But it, it this is a literally that's one of the most dangerous things for the residents of Malibu. Exactly. I'm, I get I get that on my agenda to try and do something with. So thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Two two last maybe one last point. Oh, two, two questions. Bill Winoker talked about the process, and, and, and he and I have talked about this a little bit. You know, if I had my druthers, and, and I don't, but if I had my druthers and I wanted to take care of the homeless people, I would do something along the line that says, okay, I've got a, a, a shelter someplace, all right? And I got 40 beds. Well, the people I want of those 40 beds are people who are willing, to, are looking to move out of the shelter into some kind of permanent housing or different situation. And to do that, you know, my deal would be that says, look, I'll give you shelter, I'll give you some food, but you gotta work. Four days a week, I want you to go out into the Malibu and help us pick up trash, for example, all right? You gotta do that. 
And if you do that, I'll pay you. And I'll put a little bit of money in your pocket now, and I'll take a portion of that money and put it into a bank account for you. So that when you get ready to move out of Malibu into a permanent residence, I've got a little stash ready for you to help you pay the first month's rent. Is that possible? I mean, is that, is that legally, can you do that? I don't know. You know, I don't know if I'm, if I'm allowed to comment. I'd, I'd love to address that. Yeah, go ahead. I, I'm just, I, I was just, we've talked ahead, about man. that. And it seems to me to be the way to not only, you know, help them, help them help themselves, help them help Malibu and get sort of a return for our investment of doing all this stuff. You know, Councilman, you're, I think you're exactly right. You know, people should have the dignity of providing for themselves and working to the extent they're able. And if people can can work, can provide them for themselves, they should. And so part of helping people get that work towards self-reliance is something like you said. If they're able to support themselves, if they're able to contribute, if they're able to work, you know, again, you're having, having this ASL, you'd want to have job programs, experience, maybe even some way of giving them uh, an apprenticeship or some kind of employment. But I think that's exactly right. We can't be expected to just feed people because they want to live on the beach. And back to your earlier point about numbers, you know, we're, we're, I don't think we can be expected, if somebody wants to come to Malibu, there's no obligation for us to house them. And so this idea of local's preference is, I think, very important. And to, to Bill's excellent comment about you know, what does that mean? There are specific requirements. Laguna Beach has specific requirements. If you you know, if you went to school here, if you had a parent or even a grandparent, not a man, not a man, not a man. Um, um, he, he was here for a certain period of time, time before the ASL was so there's no incentive to bring him in. But you know, if you were talking about taking care of our own community first, you know, I don't think we're talking about massive numbers that are just ballooning. People aren't going to come here, you know, to, to come to the ASL or focus on taking care of our own people. Yeah, they're they're going to come to Malibu. They're going to come to Malibu. But not, but but not. We're not going to go to the ASL. Yeah. Gonna, look, if I was homeless, I used to live on the East Coast in the middle of winter. Do I want to live on a great New York City or live out here in Malibu? That's not even a choice. <laughs> you know. Okay. Last, well, last, enforcement comes into play. last point, and Mike, I'll turn it back over to you. You know, I think one of the things I think we owe the residents is we've, we sort of probably going to flush this one out a little bit more tonight. Uh, it's some of the other ideas that have been presented, whether it's Bruce's idea, whether it's the idea from Kelly, uh, uh, Georgiana Goldfarb sent through an idea that I sent to you guys earlier today, or I guess she sent to you. Uh, somehow we ought to flush those things out. And see if they give us any any place to go on. Uh, and John, I like your I read your report on Bruce's idea. Uh, I think we should get a second opinion. Not that I don't think you're a good lawyer, uh, but my experience. I'll give you just an example. Christy Hogan used to work for us here in Malibu, and she we had we got an LIP that says you can't have short-term rentals. So Christy said, "Well, I don't care what your LIP says. You got to have short-term rentals." She's up in Santa Barbara right now, arguing with the Coastal Commission, the entirely opposite position. She's saying, well, the LIP says you can't have short-term rentals. So if, if we're going to go through with Bruce, and Bruce, you know better how to do this than I do. I mean, we got to make sure we understand what the heck we're arguing about and whether that thing is legal and how we really flesh that out. Mikey, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, Karen? Thank you. I wasn't sure. John, were you going to say something there? I welcome the second opinion. <laughs> oh, thank you, John. Okay. I'm, just, I'm not, no disrespect intended, John. Understood. <laughs> Understood. And, I, and, and as, as you've read the memo, yes. you know that it doesn't say it's, that it's illegal. It says that there are risks. I understand. I appreciate it. It also gives you other paths and, and, and ways to move forward. Understood. Okay, thank you. Uh, I really, really want to thank the presenters. Um, Paul Davis, thank you so much. I know you put a lot of time into this and not just on the PowerPoint, but on all the uh, work that's led up to you being able to put that together. Um, and I, I think it's a good reference document for us. Um, I too visited Laguna and it accurately captures uh, what we saw down there. Uh, and I know there were two lawsuits, one from, I think it's called Catholic Workers Group or something like that. 
and the other one from the ACLU. Uh, so we'd love to avoid uh, lawsuits from either, um, you know, from any kind of advocates group. Uh, but that means getting ahead of the curve. Um, Gabriel, Graham, thank you so much. I very much uh, appreciate your weekly report every Friday that you give to all the COG cities. And as we all know, uh, or I'll make sure everybody knows, uh, of the five COG cities, certainly Malibu has a disproportionate um, number of unhoused individuals. And your report re reflects that every week. Um, and I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Braden and our city attorney, interim city attorney, John Cotty. So some various things, and, and it's hard for me with so many notes. I may not do this in the most um, organized fashion, but um, so, you know, there's, there's just incremental um, uh, victories that we've had, and there, there's no one major uh, problem that we're able to solve. Uh, at any one time. So we have the parking restrictions. That took effort and we uh, we would have liked to, I would have liked to have seen them more restrictive, but we uh, went for uh, what the county was able to achieve uh, with the Coastal Commission. We mirrored their ordinance uh, down by the chart house or whatever it is now, Mastro's, and we were able to get that. Uh, we also uh, now have the oversized vehicle ordinance that is about to uh, start enforcement. So bit by bit, as Lieutenant Braden said, it takes, uh, you know, a variety of approaches. And so I think the ASL is one of those um, approaches. So I'm going to move on here. Um, yeah, the combination and, and it's, it's, it's going to change as the needs change, you know, as we all know, like I've lived in Malibu, since the days when we only had one homeless person and everybody knew him and that was old Joe. And things have changed a lot since then. Um, but as we've seen in the, uh, in the PowerPoint and from Susan Duenas and uh, maybe some others, that ASL allowed Laguna to clean up their beaches, to clean up encampments, to reduce fire risk, to help people who were the most amenable to being helped. Um, and I'll reiterate, nobody can uh, use that Laguna shelter unless they agree to enroll in services and enroll in an active search for housing. So it's not just a place to hang out. If, if anybody is under that impression, I'm not in favor of something like that myself, certainly. Um, Moving on here, um, John Cotty's memo uh, and your statements tonight. Uh, it'd be great if the solution were something as simple as a no camping ordinance. That We'd all love that. But from what we've heard from our interim city attorney and from our lieutenant, um, that's not enforceable. So. I trust their judgment. Excuse me? I trust their judgment. Um, Scott Dietrich, I too do not want to see any scammers come in and take advantage of, uh, of any program that we do here. And the people that we have here, um, Tiffany, uh, everybody that's been working, Scott Edens, Gabriel, in my opinion, they're underpaid. They're, they're incredibly hardworking. The volunteers like Kay Gabbard and, and Paul Elder, they're in favor of an ASL. And, and I think we need to listen to the people who've been in the field uh, and in the trench the longest. Um, and I, I too agree with Paul's concept of, of giving people a hand up, not a hand out. And if there are ways uh, to encourage or even leverage people to uh, search for work, enroll in work programs. I'm all for that. Um, Ani, 
I'm so sorry. I hope you're still on the call. Uh, we texted each other the, that evening on Friday when that happened to you. I'm so, or was it Monday? Sorry, it's been a tough week for everybody. I'm so, so sorry that that happened. Uh, I too would have been terrified. I'm really glad Madison was there. Um, and I believe that incident was reported. And I'm, I'm glad that you uh, that you did that, took that step to report it. I'm glad it didn't turn out any worse. Um, Kelly, service resistant. Yeah, they're scary. I agree. Uh, the service resistant is probably not the population that uh, any ASL is geared toward. The ASL is not going to solve all the problems. We know that. So here's something. Uh, Kelly mentioned it and Bill Winoker. Um, the model that Beverly Hills, and I think it's kind of the uh, eastern edge of Culver City, western edge of, of uh, LA, I, I'm guessing it's around La Cienega because that sounds like that to me. Um, that, that arrangement, if we could make something like that work here, I would definitely be willing to explore it. I think our uh, isolation, our geography, the size of our city and the di distance to other cities makes it tough. Um, I, I don't know if people would be transported up or down the coast or through the mountains, uh, but I'm definitely willing to look into something like that, but I think it would be in, in combination with the ASL. Um, Pam Mulek, I totally agree. And I think everybody thinks the same way. Yeah, we wanna balance and we need to balance public safety with a solution. Doing nothing, Mikey has said it over and over again, is not an option. Um, waiting until a solution is imposed on us is not a good plan and we all need to acknowledge there's a cost to the city right now of not having, uh, you know, we have our homeless outreach workers and I'm thankful for that, but not having any kind of a facility or an active program, that's costing us money. So I, I don't want to pretend like the cost right now is zero. Uh, and who was it? I, I heard something about people yeah, sure, people would like to be in Malibu. They'd like to be in an RV in Malibu. We now have the oversized vehicle ordinance and we have the parking restrictions. So those numbers are going down. Um, and as far as, as paying for this, I, I think it'd be a combination. I think we would be able to apply for grants. Uh, we've had Measure H money that the city has used. I think it's worth a city investment uh, above and beyond our outreach workers. And again, the, the cost right now is not zero, doing nothing. So I, I and I understand, I thousand percent understand there's no one location that's gonna make everybody happy. We all know that. And every city we've talked to has said the same thing. So, um, those are my comments for now, but I, you know, I think we're on the right path and we need to, like uh, Lieutenant Braden said, I guess uh, I'll paraphrase, chip away at this problem with a combination of solutions. That's it for me. Thank you, Karen. Bruce, Paul, comments? Okay, Bruce, I think that's your hand up. I'll be happy to go next. Sure. So I've, I've got some prepared comments and then I want to um, go through some comments that we got from a number of the speakers. By the way, with one exception, the speakers were all excellent and I, I got a lot out of everything that everyone said. I'll get to the one later. But, you know, federal, state, county, and local politicians who claim they can't protect the residents without building shelters or ASLs or providing other benefits to the unhoused population garner the votes of the progressive left while avoiding the loss of support of others because they take political cover in the lie that their hands are tied. At the same time, these politicians rake in substantial campaign contributions 
and other side benefits from lobbyists for the homeless industry industrial complex, which is the recipient of billions of dollars of public funding to build shelters and develop other recovery boondoggles that are doomed to failure while producing huge profits for private industry. These are facts. It's time to fight the lie that the law compels Malibu to provide shelters and other benefits as the quid pro quo for being able to enforce laws designed to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Politicians who are perpetuating that lie are either being duped or they're complicit in the corruption that the lie protects. Either alternative is unacceptable. Now, this community is very, like all other communities, very divided on the issues pertaining to homelessness. As best I can tell, and I could be wrong, but as best I can tell, the majority of the residents are concerned about the rise in crime associated with indigent transients. They're concerned about fires initiated at homeless encampments. They're concerned about health and environmental issues that are associated with the homeless population. And they're looking to us to provide measures to promote the health, safety, and welfare of the community. A vocal minority who are not representative of the community at large are clamoring to care for the homeless in Malibu, to provide them with food and shelter, and to miraculously transform them into pro productive members of society. These issues transcend the question of what can be done for any one or small group of individuals. The issue is more complicated than most of us understand or appreciate or are capable of understanding or appreciating, including myself. Homelessness is the result and a symptom of multiple causes, many of which are beyond the capacity of society as a whole, as currently configured, to address in a meaningful manner. Mental illness is capable of being addressed, but not if the mentally ill are free to reject treatment. By saying that, I'm not advocating involuntary treatment. I'm just offering an empirical reality. You can't help people that do not want help. Alcohol and other substance abuse is capable of being addressed. And as Ga but I think Gabriel said this, and I'll talk about Gabriel a little bit later, only through a combination of approaches, all of which require that the addict wants recovery and seeks recovery for the sake of recovery, not to secure a material benefit such as food or shelter. By providing food and shelter to an addict who isn't seeking recovery, we are enabling the addict. This is not universally the case. I'm not saying that it's not possible to aid any one individual by providing them food, shelter, and love and care, but, as a, but the vast majority of addicts, that's not gonna help. You can't love them into recovery. We certainly can provide help to people who've lost their homes on account of medical bills, jobs lost on account of COVID-19, fires, other factors beyond the control of these people, victims of domestic and child abuse, and others are who are capable of being self-sustaining members of society if they can get back on their feet. And those are the people I believe we ought to be concentrating on. We have limited resources. Society has limited resources. And there are people who can accept help, who can take that hand up and will succeed. Unfortunately, the mentally ill and the addicts are for the most part not among that population. Significantly, the people who, who've been bankrupt by medical bills, lost jobs, many of them have support systems that provide a safety net. They don't fall through the cracks for the most part. They don't end up on the street, but to the extent they do, they're clearly deserving of our help in my view. Now turning to Malibu, like any other community, we do have a moral obligation, I believe, to care for our residents who've fallen on hard times, who are capable of being helped to get back on their feet. I don't think there are any people that meet that description in Malibu. Maybe, there is a, maybe there's a handful, maybe. Nobody's identified them. With rare exception, the unhoused population in Malibu has migrated to Malibu from other communities that have failed or refused to help them. In that sense, Malibu is being asked to pick up the financial tab for other cities that refuse or fail to do so. It's not selfish or otherwise inappropriate for the majority of Malibu residents to be incensed by that dynamic. Malibu has many wealthy residents, that's true, 
These wealthy residents pay substantial property taxes and income taxes, most of which go to LA County, the state of California, and the US government. Those larger government units are responsible for the homeless population outside of Malibu, and they shouldn't be pawning off their responsibility to Malibu. That's not fair, that's not appropriate. If the pool of funds available to the county, the state, or the US government are insufficient to provide relief needed for them to help those who are capable of being helped in their areas, taxes can be raised across the board, which impacts the wealthy more than anyone else on account of graduated income tax. Economies of scale can be tapped by larger government institutions. Experts can be employed to help the community at large. Malibu lacks the expertise and the physical resources. I think Bill Sampson said, this is not a solution from the bottom up. We don't even have a hospital. Malibu shouldn't have to be the solution for the residents of other cities who've been dumped in Malibu to reduce the cost of other cities. And many people who, purchase, who live in Malibu purchase their homes at great expense to live in a community that doesn't have the problems of a large city like Los Angeles. Having paid for that privilege to live in such a community with the payment mainly going to other places, as I described the taxes, they deserve to get what they paid for. If Los Angeles, LA County, and other places lack the funds needed to care for their residents, they need to find ways to obtain more funds to care for their residents. Giving them to Malibu, extorting Malibu is not the answer. Once word gets around that we're gonna provide help to those who are dumped in Malibu, we'll become a destination for people in other cities looking for help will be a destination for other cities looking to dump their residents. Then what? There needs to be a global solution that transcends Malibu and other individual communities. Without a global solution, there's no solution at all. We need to pool our limited resources with those of other communities to help develop a global solution. Otherwise, we're just throwing our limited resources into a bottomless pit. Homelessness is an international problem. It requires a paradigm shift of a solution. We're not going to solve the problem in Malibu. Moreover, we're not dealing with local residents again who've lost their homes. We're dealing with residents of Los Angeles and elsewhere that are being pawned off to surrounding communities to ease the economic burden of other cities that can't bear that burden themselves. Now, comments from the residents, which again, with one exception, they were all really phenomenal and really helpful. And I think actually Scott started off, he nailed it. I, I would be remiss if I didn't let Mr. Bowdy go unremarked. Mr. Bowdy says motives are important. They are. Motives are very important. And I suggest that people examine his motives. History is important, too. He, he, he has suggested to people that they should be looking up me and sanctions in the past. I suggest people go on the Internet and look up Bowdy and sanctions. Bowdy and pro hoc revoke. Bowdy and slut shaming. Bowdy and incivility, Bowdy and accosting children. I think you should look all of those things up to understand motives because Mr. Bowdy is working with people who have an agenda. He's not, he is a lawyer, but when he, speaks as a, when he speaks and purports to give legal advice, he's being an advocate. He's not being an objective lawyer. As a, he's not even a resident of Malibu, but when he speaks, he's speaking from an advocate position. Now, he says that the reason that Steve and I have proposed the amended no camping ordinance is to keep an ASL from the city hall parking lot. I never even heard of that when I ran for office. I never heard of that when I drafted the um, proposal. I heard about it within the last couple of weeks for the first time. Let me say this. If the residents of Malibu overwhelmingly want an ASL in the parking lot of city hall, I'll support it. I said that when I was asked that question during the campaign, I was asked, do you support a shelter in the Civic Center area? And my answer then and my answer now was, it really doesn't matter. I'm sorry, I was asked, do I want one? And it doesn't matter what I want. It matters what the residents want. I'm here to represent the residents. If the residents want a shelter in the Civic Center area, I will support the residents preference. If the residents want an ASL in the city hall parking lot, I will support the residents preference. Also, I will commit to support whatever we decide to move forward with when we ever decide to move forward with something. The fact that I oppose things, and, and I, look, I believe in this. You have, a drop, you, have a, you have a drag out fight over what's the right thing to do. 
Everyone asserts their positions. People have very strong positions. But once we make a decision, we're then all together on the decision. And I will do whatever is necessary to help us, the city, the residents, do what, the, what is decided is in the best interest of the city. Just because I don't agree that it's in the best interest doesn't mean I'll help. But for now, we haven't decided what's in the best interest. So I'm advocating what I believe to be in the best interest. Okay. Um, Krista Win Windish, you know, that was a difficult thing to listen to. It's not the first time I've heard a story like that. I'm very keyed in with the recovery community in Malibu and outside of Malibu. And unfortunately, that's a very common story. Um, it's also very evident of what I was saying before that you can only help people that wanna be helped. Obviously, Krista's brother has a support system, has a family that cares about him, has a family that could take him in, but he's living on the street. Why would he live in an ASL? If he can't live with his family, why is he gonna live with strangers who are gonna give him a regimented way to live? When and if he wants help, he'll get the help. Until he wants the help, he won't get the help. It's just, it's just the hard facts of life. I look forward to working with John. And I don't think we need a second opinion. We, we don't need another law firm to look at this. I would like, to, I'd, I'd be happy to work with John to go through the proposal because I think there are some misunderstandings in the analysis of what the proposal actually is. And I think there are some misunderstandings. There's not misunderstandings of law. Here, let me talk about this. When John says the law doesn't support this, what he doesn't say is the law doesn't prohibit it. The law doesn't address it. These are issues of first impression. You know, when, when you're litigating issues of first impression, the party that's opposed to some, the thing always says, oh, there's no law that supports this. And the party that supports it says, oh, there's no law that opposes this. It's an issue of first impression. So then what do you do? You look at what the signals are in the law. Well, the decision itself, the, the, Boise, the Martin v. Boise decision, which is the only decision that gives us heartburn, and there are, ever since then, there have been decisions cutting into it, not expanding it, cutting into it. But that decision was an exception to the rule. It created an exception. When, when you get a new decision that creates an exception, that's the limit of the exception. It's not beyond that. Now, the decision itself provides a roadmap for what can still be done despite that limited decision. And the proposal that Steve and I put together follows the roadmap of Martin versus Boise. It doesn't protest Martin versus Boise. It doesn't, it doesn't seek to argue that Martin versus Boise is wrong. It follows the roadmap of Martin versus Boise. I defy any lawyer in the country to find a decision that says that anything that's proposed in that is impermissible. It, those, that law does not exist. Now, when I was practicing law in Delaware, corporate law, in the late 80s, um, take, hostile takeovers abounded in the country. And they were, they were viewed to be very detrimental to employees, to communities. Some communities were wiped out by hostile takeovers because the acquirer just cared about taking the company apart, selling off the pieces, firing the employees. Some cities disappeared. Um, some states tried to create anti-takeover laws and they were held unconstitutional. Delaware decided to create an a, a anti-takeover law, and I was the principal draftsman of that anti-takeover law. The first, I, I, I took my pen to the first draft, and then I played a substantial role in the tweaking with that, tweaking of it. We got the law that the court said was constitutional. I understand how the Constitution works. I'm not saying I'm the world's best expert. I know Mr. Cod, Mr. Mr. Bowdy probably could help us figure this out if he really cared and didn't just want to tear down me and Steve. I'm sure he could help because despite the fact that he's in civil, slut shaming, had his pro hoc vice um, revoked by a court, which is extraordinary. He's a good lawyer, he's a smart lawyer and he could be helping rather than hurting. But in any event, I know what I'm doing. And I'd love to work with John because I think between us, we could put something together that John would be more comfortable with.
dealing with the AC, go, voluntarily trying to create something that we would then enter into a compact with adversaries to these things and enter into a court supervised settlement is insane. People are worried about the state coming in. Sure, let's instead make a pact with the federal government so that they're in control. And if they decide that we're not doing something that's satisfactory down the line, a single member of the federal judiciary who's appointed for life can make decisions that change how Malibu has to operate. That's insanity. The reason that there is a court supervised super settlement in some other jurisdictions is because they didn't have well thought out laws. They had more serious problems than we have and they didn't address them properly. The state's not gonna come in to Malibu and mandate a solution in Malibu. The state's either gonna mandate a solution for the entire state of California or it's not gonna do anything. And we all know how fast the state of California operates. It's glacial. glacial. But they're not going to, there, there's no way that the state of California says Malibu. We, we, yeah, we don't care about the rest of the state of California. We don't care whether other states, other cities are operating well or handling this problem well. We're going to focus on you, Malibu, and we're going to create special rules for Malibu to make you start behaving better. That doesn't happen. That's not the way it works. That is a boogeyman. Gabriel, uh, Gabriel's a great success story. Gabriel, I, I, I applaud your recovery. Um, I, I'd love to talk with you. Um, Gabriel's a rarity. The, success, the recovery community is a numbers game. For every tens, hundred maybe, people that try to get straight, you have a few that succeed. And, th and that's wonderful. They are wonderful examples, but they're the exceptions to the rule. And you can't, you know, it's just like people say, oh, smoking is not bad for you. My great, great grandfather lived to be 100 and he smoked two packs a day. Yeah, there's exceptions to the rule. Smoking is bad for you. Well, people can recover, but that's not, that's not generally what happens. Homelessness itself is not a threat to the health, safety and welfare of our community or any community. Mentally ill, transients, drug addicted transients and criminals. And I'm not saying mentally ill people are criminals. I'm not saying drug addicted people are criminals, but there are criminals who are homeless. They are a threat to the health, safety and welfare of our community. And one of the things that the proposal that Steve and I put together had in it was that when someone came and asked for a permit or we went to them to get them a permit. I understand John's point about you can't make it impracticable and that was never the intention. But one of the things you do with, before you give them a permit, it was the only condition to getting a permit, by the way, for a truly homeless person, was you do a criminal background check. Not a, I'm sorry, not a criminal background check, a warrant check. See whether they are have an outstanding warrant, whether they've skipped bail, whether they've skipped their um, probation, because those people shouldn't be in our community. In fact, those people ought to be locked up because they are avoiding the criminal justice system. And those people are a danger. Um, people who belong on Megan's law lists, they are a danger. They are the only people that, the, that this was conditioned against. And like I said, we, the devil's always in the details. We could, John and I could work that out. I'm confident that we could get to a point that John would be comfortable. Um, the ASL, the, the, Paul, you and I have spoken a number of times. We've had really good conversations. That ASL presentation, you know, it, it had me feeling really good listening to it. It was a great story. Unfortunately, so are Disney fairy tales. We live in the real world. We don't live in the fairy tale world. There are so many problems with that presentation that if it could be, I mean, if that could be successful, hey, that could be sold across the country. It's a solution. But there are way too many problems with it. And it doesn't even, in the first instance, solve the legal problem that I'm told the camping ordinance doesn't solve. Because as Steve was saying, you know, you first of all, I don't think 40 beds answers the question. I think, Jane, I think James, um, Jim talked about that. And so, and so did John, 40 beds doesn't answer the question. And once, let, let, let's say though, let's say we need 80 beds today to be able to enforce the law. 
Uh, and then we get another 100 transients who think Malibu is a great place to come to or are pawned off on Malibu by the city of Los Angeles or, or by Michigan. Uh, now we need another 80 beds. And then we get twice as many people because, hey, we've got this thing working really well in Malibu. Now we need another 160 beds. When does it end? We need to take a stand. The law does not mandate that we have a shelter. The law does not mandate that we have an ASL. It's the camel's nose under the tent. Even a pilot program, it's the camel's nose under the tent, as Steve said. Once you, once you start going down that road, there's no turning back. Look at Skid Row. I don't get how Judge Carter is talking to a representative of the city of Malibu. That really, just, just as a lawyer, I, I, don't get, I don't get how a representative of the city of Malibu can even be talking to anyone outside of Malibu in a government position without the assent of the entire city council. I thought we had a policy about that. And I don't get how a federal judge can be talking to someone who could potentially be a representative of a, of a defendant in a future lawsuit involving federal issues. Don't get that at all. Um, measure H, you know, that's another thing. It's where it all comes down to. How do we suck up dollars? How do we get more dollars from the state? Because that's the other part of the politician game. I, I don't mean us people here, that's, but that's the part of the managing the city game, bringing in dollars, bringing in dollars, spending dollars, having a bigger, bigger budget. That's not what's in the best interest of the residents, but it looks good on paper. If I missed anybody major who made, and again, the, the residents, your, your comments are amazing. They're great. I, I, I don't believe we have a cross, a, pro, a cross section of the community here speaking today. I really believe that there is a silent majority who they have compassion. We all, I, I have compassion for all sentient beings, not just humans, all sentient beings. But there's a limit to what we can do. I mean, you know, we could, we could all just give up, give up every penny we have that we don't need for basic sustenance and contribute that to a fund to take care of as many people as we can. I don't see anybody offering to do that, even the people who are, whose hearts are bleeding for the homeless. But there's a limit to what we can do. And I believe that the vast majority of the population in Malibu doesn't want us to be doing the things that were discussed tonight and I believe a very vocal minority who show up and speak are the ones who do. And I think we need to find some way, a referendum of some sort, I think John Mazza was talking about that, we need to find some way to find out what the population truly wants. And I know, Mikey, you've said before, we're here to make the hard decisions, but sometimes the hard decision is not doing what we want, but doing what the community wants. And I think we need to know what the community truly wants. Sorry it took so long, but you know, these are very important issues. And I'm really glad we had this ability to have this meeting. I think all we're going to do is kick the can further down the road after this meeting. We're going to go nowhere. And I think we really do need to come back to looking at the ordinance that Steve and I proposed, because that can provide some immediate relief to a city that I think the majority of the, of the residents are clamoring for while we investigate the ASL and shelter and various other proposals because that's something that could be done right away. And I believe we can get over the legal hurdles. And I agree with, I think it was Bill Sampson who said, if the county lawyers are for political reasons standing in the way, fine, let's sue them. Let's sue the county. We pay $8 million a year for sheriff support. Let's sue the people who are standing in the way of us getting the support we pay for. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. Paul? Thank you, everybody. And I appreciate everybody talking. I won't thank as many people as some of the other people have done. I'd, I'd like to take a moment and thank the people who took the time to call me and spent time on the phone with me. Paul Davis, Kelly Pessis, Bill Winokur, Lynn Norton. Uh, there are others. Uh, the and, and Bruce is right that recovery requires motivation and buy-in from those who need help. And I, I have personal experience with uh, someone who I've been trying to help for the last 10 years. And it's 
it doesn't matter what you offer them if they're not willing to do what's going to take to help themselves it's not going to happen i like the thing i like about the asl concept is the concept that we determine what our fair share of the burden is and we provide that and it's you know as far as the the teaming masses who then want to come out and jump in on it no it's it's uh it's 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 not i don't think anybody in sacramento wants all of us us to take everybody although they they seem to want to take control of our zoning and and make it possible to for everybody to have 800 dwelling units on their house on their lot uh the I have great affection for the idea that Kelly Pessis was talking about doing a partnership with a nearby community. Uh, I don't know why Beverly Hills and Culver City are able to do it. Is it because it's it's within four or five miles of the city limits of Beverly Hills? Is it because they put the deal together in 2008? And so they solved a problem early on. And if we tried to do it that way now, we'd, we'd get hammered on it. I don't know the answer. I'd like to know the answer. Uh, do we have to do something with more than one surrounding community? Uh, I've been to uh, forums in Santa, in Santa Monica where they had representatives of all the homeless service people there and they gave a full day presentation on it and it they've got quite a complex going there and I'm, I'm continuously asking myself wouldn't it make a lot more sense for us to approach people who are currently operating some of these things and say to them we'd like to fund a an expansion of what you're doing now and they I guess the, the question is how do we get people to those locations where they actually have mental health counseling, where they have job counseling, where they have jobs programs, where they have medical programs set to meet with them over and over again. And uh, that's what I'm thinking about. And I'm very interested that, uh, to hear that there's something going on with Judge Carter and I'd love to hear what, if there's anything to share. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, I want to share something. AB 1372 by Murasuchi is a bill pending before in California. Summary would require every city and every county in the case of unincorporated areas to provide every person who is homeless as defined with temporary shelter, mental health treatment, resources for job placement and job training until that person obtains permanent housing. That is a pending bill. So to think that the state is not gonna force something down us eventually, I have no idea if this bill will pass, it's early. Bills are just being floated out there now. To think that it's not coming our way seems a little foolish. Um, I think that's a, a bad strategy. And off, furthermore, the bill would require the city or county as applicable to provide rent subsidy too. If, if as specified, they're unable to provide temporary shelter. I did get a chance to meet with Judge Carter, was it yesterday? Yeah, it came up quickly. Um, we've been trying to reach out to him for a while. I don't have his phone number. We don't, we don't barbecue or anything like that. And I think there's an interesting thing about Judge Carter I wanna share. I think if he was here at this meeting, people would be really impressed with him. He's, he's, he's not, he's a regular guy, blue jean wearing, city focused kind of judge. His 
job, the way I, if I had to paraphrase them is how to take care of cities while satisfying the law as he understands it. And as we know, he's a big part of it here in Southern California. He is the federal judge. Does he exactly tell, did he tell us me what to do? No, that's not how it works. But he is willing to talk about it. Absolutely. His, our conversation yesterday, what I got from it, and I'll just paraphrase, is we need to move forward on solutions or we're going to fall behind. And he says that won't be pretty. Wealthy beach cities are becoming targets. Take that for what you want. And this is involving homelessness. If we don't do something, eventually we'll be forced to do something. And then I see AB 1372, and I'm thinking, wow, is this coming this quickly? I don't know. His opinion, doing something over nothing, and I think we all agree on doing something, helps insulate us from lawsuits because it shows we're trying. The interesting thing, like one of the questions I had for him based on the other time I got to meet him was about the, the deal that Bruce referred to. That, that deal is no longer available. So that ship sailed. All 22 cities that made that deal with the judge, I don't know if I'm using the right, I'm not a lawyer, the right language on deal, but went to the advocate, agreed to be sued, agreed to settle all in one motion. None of those cities have been sued. It would appear to offer fairly good protection. But that deal is not available anymore because with the current advocate, which is the uh, Roman or the, the Catholic uh, work, I, I always forget their name. Catholic workers. Say it again. Catholic workers. The Catholic workers isn't available because they would insist on it including in the deal, a path, a plan for housing as well, permanent housing. And clearly that's overwhelming to anyone right now, I think to try and wrap into one package. I asked him about the Beverly Hills, Culver City deal. And more importantly, I asked him about us joining with other areas. It's possible. It should be looked at, but he did not hold out any hope because of our geography, that it was really a great idea. He didn't say it was a terrible idea. He doesn't talk that way. Um, but the geographic issues were, were certainly mentioned because Malibu is so long. And he knows Malibu. Um, he's been following everything going on in Malibu. His daughter also lives in the Palisades. I did once again, I asked him to come to Malibu. He didn't say no. He's too busy chatting. He's kind of a chatty guy, he likes to tell stories. Like I said, I think you guys would like him. The rest of my notes, that's that pretty much encompasses, I think, on Judge Carter. If anything else comes to mind, I'll add it. Some other notes. The reason if we're to do an ASL, I believe it needs to be temporary, is because I strongly believe the federal and state government have a huge responsibility here that they are not upholding. And I want to remain hopeful that they do their job and step up. I think it's unfair that we're left in this situation, but here we are. And I think it's more unfair not to try and improve the situation for our city. I think doing what we're doing is clearly not enough. I believe we all agree on that. I don't think anyone just wants to let it go on it as it is. I don't 
really think, I think one speaker said it's getting better. It, I, I don't think long-term it's going to get better. I do have one more note on Judge Carter. He mentioned that any, I believe when I've talked, which by the way, I've talked to a lot of, of, of uh, higher up government officials on this issue. I believe when I talked to Sheila Kuehl or was to her office, the same thing Carter said is do something soon because the funding is more available now and you don't know about the future. And I don't know what that funding is. I seriously have no idea. To everyone that wants the LA County Sheriff to be more aggressive in enforcing the laws that they aren't now due to their guidance from the uh, district attorney's office, the reason is simple. They have been sued and they've lost. And they don't want to be in the business of losing. Matter of fact, Part of their mission is to not get, not get sued. They are not an organization that tries to, well, maybe they do sometimes, but generally push the law and, and, and go to court. This is a random note related to listening to comments on the ASL idea. An ASL is not an open facility. It's, it's fenced and it's, got security. This is, it's not this, you know, open campus or anything like that. It's a modular insulated entity. So I wanted, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and I want to, a couple things here. John Mazza, I totally agree with you. This is a process the community has to be involved in. Absolutely, 100%. This is, this is just an important step. We have to take this step. We have to do more. What we're doing is endangering right now is, is leaving us, our, you know, our community in danger. People are getting hurt. There's fires, there's trash, people are scared. We have a fiduciary responsibility to protect our city and our, and our, and our residents. And I'm a compassionate person, but as city councilor, my first duty is to the citizens and the city of, of Malibu. And right now we know anytime it's windy, you know, I'm out on arson watch driving down Tuna Canyon worried to bits that there's me another huge fire. So yes, John, you're right. It's it's a it is it is a process involving the community. And I'll say this about saying that an ASL wouldn't work, but we we have proof they do. <laughs> we just do. I urge people that think an ASL doesn't work to go visit Laguna Beach and see if the model makes sense for us. It obviously impressed the, those of us that went down there. I think there was eight of us. We were down there. We didn't know what to expect. And, and I think maybe without seeing it, you don't quite get the flavor. 40, 45 beds. You have this view, vision of this kind of like, you're in this Laguna Beach, you got this bed. No, you know what the beds are? They're blue mats, like mile, um, what do you call it? What's that material? just blue mats with foam and they're piled against a wall. And then in an open space and in, in some trailers pushed together. And then at night they throw them down on the ground and they put a few tables up the middle, girls on one side, boys on the other. It's not luxurious. It's not somewhere you want to hang out. It's somewhere you want to move up from. And the bargain they strike, they strike is real. You either commit to moving up and out or you have to leave our city. That's the bargain. How does that not make our city more safe, cleaner? Admittedly, there are a lot of other structures out there that don't work. 
And do I know for sure that this will work? No, but we've looked around. And done right, it's interesting where, where you see them. Bellflower, which Karen and I drove by, is right next to these apartment buildings in some sort of building. I don't know. It might have been some sort of shop type building. I don't know what it was. Light industrial, small. And yeah, the neighbors were concerned. We, we got to see there's no concern anymore. The neighbors are involved. They're helping out. It's, it's, it's not, it's clean. It's beautiful. It's a church across the street, apartment buildings right there. And there's this ASL. It was shocking. And their before and after pictures are the same in Bellflower. People living in tents and tarps and all over the sidewalk. And they were just thought it was the end of the world when they tried to open this place. And they got ready for it. The police were ready. They were warning everyone for two weeks. They expected this giant disaster when they opened it and nothing happened. The majority of people left town and the rest moved into the ASL. I know, I think I saw here, and I hope she's still here. I do want to ask if, if Don Price is still here. I don't see your name on my screen, but if, oh, there you are. Don, would, would you give us, you know, we've heard all this talk about Laguna Beach and would you just introduce yourself quickly and just give us a flavor for your impressions on what's going on here and, and, and what you do? You bet. Thank you for the opportunity. And I, I, I said, I want to start out. I'm Don Price. I'm the executive director at Friendship Shelter in Laguna Beach. We are the operator, have been the operator of the ASL since it opened in 2009. Um, sitting here tonight and hearing you guys struggle with this issue, it, it's, it's very, very familiar to me. Um, our community struggled. I started as executive director at Friendship Shelter in uh, the fall of 2008. And in December was that first ACLU lawsuit. So I had not worked in homelessness before. I'd been a nonprofit executive, but I was new to this um, work. And there we were um, with this with this. Uh, problem in front of us and a lot of um, a lot of feelings in our community similar to the ones we've heard tonight. I want to make it clear we serve South Orange County. I have no um, no plan to, uh, to to come and operate your ASL. Um, that's not our service area. So I have no um, you know no skin in this game other than to tell you our story and tell, tell you that it's working. Um, I also want to make it clear I'm not a, a representative of the city. I don't work for the city. I can't speak to enforcement um, or government issues. I can only speak to our programs. So what I can tell you is that um, we were forced to move quickly. So we um, got this program up and running once we made the decision to go with this model in six weeks. Six weeks before the trailers were put up and we had the program in place. And we've learned a lot in that process. It's been, you know, 11 plus years now. Um, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. I Early in this meeting, Lieutenant Braden um, mentioned that it won't be perfect. No, it won't. Um, but it's easier to make the mistakes and pivot as you're going than to discuss it forever. So I would just offer that to you as well. Um, what we've learned is that um, some of these concerns about, well, you've got 40 beds and then what if more people come? Well, you've got to have movement through your program. You have to have uh, people working with your shelter guests, helping them make housing plans, helping them take action on those plans, bringing resources in, um, in so that people can go into housing and moving people through those beds so that you can turn those beds over a couple times a year. Our average length of stay for people who get housing is around 90 days. Our average length of stay for people who leave the program without being housed is under 30 days. So people pretty quickly figure out whether they are going to work our program and, and work toward housing. About two thirds go into housing that's unsubsidized. Importantly, another third go into housing that is subsidized and that's where the federal and state money comes in. That's, those are the subsidies for the housing. Um, looking over my notes just to see what might be helpful. Um, 
we've learned some lessons during COVID. Um, we've learned, we, I, our organization um, had those blue mats you mentioned forever, and we really fought COTS. We finally accepted COTS during COVID because we had to move people further apart. We needed a place for their stuff and we were wrong. COTS are working great. So that's something, you know, we go 11 years in, we're still learning and we're still improving and making the program work better. Uh, it is important to have the helping staff, not just, you're not just babysitting people, you're helping them with their housing plan, helping them um, with an income plan, work or otherwise, and helping them move on to their next step. Um, and uh, it's working. That's all I can say. And I'm here as a resource. I don't want to take any more time. I know it's late. Thank you, Don. I really appreciate uh, you introducing yourself and sharing. Um, okay, so I promised staff we'd be done by nine. So we're going to be done by nine, whether, no matter what it takes. And if we have, we'll, we're going to have more meetings. We won't be finished. But I want to I want to bring forward some motions now. Number one, I think we need more public outreach. And my motion would be, and I would appreciate maybe a little help forming it, but. I think we should probably do a questionnaire that we brought that's on our website. Their own time to uh, give their opinions. Um, but we need to do more than that. Um, I'm just trying to think a way to start. Did my, did my internet die? It did. I thought it did at my end, so we couldn't hear a lot of what you said. Yeah, shoot. I just saw something blink weird. So where did I where did I drop out? A questionnaire. Oh, I, I do think we need like we did with um I mean these questionnaires drive me nuts, like we did before trying to figure out what to do with our our uh Bluffs Park. We need we need a way to connect with the city, with the citizens on this issue. So I think we need to explore ways for getting that public input, getting out to everybody. Um, and maybe we could have staff come back with ideas on that. Um, I think we should explore joint efforts with other cities. That'd be my second motion. I think it's gonna be hard, but I think this whole project's hard. We already know a bunch of places that seemed like they were really good options. We've been shut down on, such as Topanga. Um, by the way, is it Saturday? They have a three hour meeting on the whole Topanga Ranch Motel plan for the public. If anyone wants to join that. So that's my second motion. Third is uh, I'd like to just make it a motion that uh, and it seems to be a plan already in place, don't even need a motion, but that John and Bruce and whatever other resources uh, we could talk about they might need work out on their camping ordinance. The reason it ended up here for everyone there was not to be unfair, is it needed to be vetted. That's the process in, in local government and probably higher up government. So let's get the vetting done and so we can check that box. And, and clearly it's, it's important. And, but that's already been agreed to, but I just wanna state that as part of my motion. Um, I am in favor of an ASL, only because I see it, I've, we spent years on this. I've been involved in homelessness for years. This is a model that works. I, I do have a great deal of faith in Paul Davis. He's done an amazing job with a group of other people with Susan. I think it works. So I think almost maybe to many people or some people, certain amount of people, almost more important than what we do is where we do it. So I think location becomes a really, really big issue. I have driven all over Malibu, particularly when I'm out on Arson Watch, thinking about this issue, because actually when you're on Arson Watch, you're looking for homeless people. <laughs> um, it's not your only duty, but it's one of them. And it wasn't my original thought, but I don't think there's anywhere good. There's, there's just no good spot that I can come up with in the city of Malibu. 
And the only last thing I thought of was, well, then we should call an airstrike on ourselves and do it in the parking lot at City Hall. How much more can we take it on ourselves? It would be fenced. I walked up there, actually by chance, Karen and I were at the City Hall sometime picking up stuff. We walked it. I think there's even room for a small, um, not for RVs, but um, potentially for some cars for a safe parking program potentially. And then, so I think we need to do a robust and immediate search of if we're gonna bring this idea forward of where. Because that really becomes the issue. The, the, we, whether we like this idea or not, and I know people are mixed on that and I respect that, if we're going to do it, we need to figure out where. I do want to point out one thing. We did our own homeless count recently. 84 people and 73 vehicles. We'd cut way down on the vehicles because of all the hard work from the Public Safety Commission, the VOP, city staff on, on parking restriction. 84 people is, and I'm counting people, whether on the street, in a shelter, in a tent, that's what I consider people outside. Cars, RVs, vans, that was 73. And so those are realistic numbers for what we could find. Was it perfect? I'm sure not. Maybe a car or two is counted that I just pull over for breakfast. I have no idea. Who knows? But that gives an idea. And yes, Judge Carter does use that 60% rule. So 84, 60% of 84 is, you know, some number. And the number does change quite a bit, which is an interesting part of it. It goes up and down often depending on weather. Vehicles, the one thing we discovered that's very interesting and a lot of other communities have too, is when you do a safe parking program, a lot of people don't show up, <laughs> they leave. Um, would we have people in one? Yes, I think it's less than we think because last time our outreach team surveyed the people living in vehicles they discovered what we discovered quickly with our no park, our parking regulations that came, um, were enacted recently. A lot of those people are not really what we're talking about as far as homeless. They're people living in vehicles, but they're not really people that are even would qualify for services. So the number becomes less than you think. And I know other communities have experienced that when they had a safe parking program. ASL and safe parking program are two separate things. I think to me, the ASL is more important because we've had good luck cutting down on the vehicles, but a, a safe parking program is important too. It's managed by an outside company and I know a lot of people end up leaving because a lot of those people aren't going to transition. As a matter of fact, I got to know some of the people living in their vehicles before our new parking regulations came in and they fought hard to stay. They were not what we're calling homeless. They were people in vehicles for other reasons. So my rough motion is public forum, have staff come back with recommendations how we can do better outreach to the entire community and then we can decide what that is. An effort, uh, a motion on really exploring and putting, and we have explored, but let's give it another go, what we can do on a joint effort with nearby cities. Number three, which was already in, in, in progress is taking a hard look at how we can flush out the camping ordinance and find that spot where we can bring it forward and have it heard properly. 
Number four, where would an ASL be if we go forward with an ASL? Yes, I, I, I've come up with City Hall. I don't think City Hall is really happy about it, but I couldn't think of anywhere else. Give me a second, Bruce. And then number five, bringing Judge Carter to Malibu so that we can hear him. We can, I don't think he'll do a public meeting, I'm going to guess. But if he could come meet with city council, I assume they're interested in that. Maybe not. That's my motions and I am uh, would love a second and then we could discuss. I will second. Okay. Uh, Bruce, you have your hand up. Oh, you're you're muted, Bruce. You're muted. Yeah, I'm right. sorry. Okay. I appreciate the thought that went into all of that, and I agree with a lot of it. Um, so, I'm going to take them in order. Just give you my thoughts. Give everybody my thoughts. Um, outreach. Outreach is, I think, essential. Questionnaire, questionable. I mean, you know, technology yeah, has improved. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we could probably blast email everyone in this, almost everyone in the city using the emergency type contact information. People are more likely, I think, to respond to a direct communication than to something on a website. Um, there's also social media, which, which you all understand that exists, not necessarily as the way to get the information, but as a way to get people to get the information. Um, but the devil's in the details. You know, everyone knows that pollsters depending on how they frame the questions, get the answers they want. So the devil's in the details in terms of what we're actually going to ask. But I, the idea of outreach is critical. Um, explore joint um, joint product, projects, some sort of other things. I think that's great. I meant I, that was one of the things I neglected to talk about in my list. You know, just important to note, Malibu's expensive real estate. We actually can get more bang for our buck. We can provide more help to more people if we are actually able to spend those dollars somewhere else. And that's not nimbyism. That's just the fact of the economy. If, if we were to be able to rent a facility that's in a lesser, in an area that has lesser property values, you can provide a better facility. That's just the way that works. And that, the, you would think the courts would think that makes sense because you want to help as many people as you can or provide as good help as you can, not simply provide help where you are. Um, I'll, as I said before, I'll be happy to work with John. I think we ought to be doing that. I'm sorry we didn't already start doing that. ASL location. Well, I mean, I, I think that's putting the cart before the horse because I, I, I don't support us having an ASL. Um, but as far as location, Mikey, I know you're a smart guy. To say it's an airstrike on ourselves, let's put it at City Hall. None of us live at City Hall. That's, that's just a business building. I mean, Steve and I do, as Mark Bowdy noted, live near City Hall. But again, if the residents wanted at City Hall, I'd fully support it. But you know, there's Trancus, which is near where you live. That's an airstrike on you. There's Heathercliff, which is an airstrike on people that live there. There's all of those locations, which is an airstrike on all our houses. Um, but to say that it's an airstrike on ourselves to put it at City Hall, I think is a little disingenuous. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Um, Judge Carter, I, I don't know how we can consistent with the Brown Act meet with Judge Carter in a way that's not a meeting because the, we, we can't, I'm told, all get together and have that meeting in private. It's not, doesn't fall in the closed door session rules. So it has to be a public meeting. But look, I, I meant to say this before too. Ju I, have, I have a tremendous respect for every federal judge in our system, hundreds of them. But what they say out of court isn't all that relevant. What one federal judge rules isn't all that relevant. Judges get reversed all the time. They have conflicting opinions throughout the country. That's why we have courts of appeals. Courts of appeals get reversed by the US Supreme Court all the time. At the end of the day, what five people in Washington think is the law of this country. And a decision by a district judge, other lawyers can comment on that. John could comment on that. But, you know, it's precedent. It's relevant. But when you've got a decision by a judge on an issue of first impression, it's not all that significant in the grand scheme of things any more than a Ninth Circuit decision, which is the only decision in the country, is all that significant to what the law ultimately is. Because the law is the same everywhere. At the end of the day, the Constitution is the Constitution. And if the Ninth Circuit's right, that's the law in New York. But if the Ninth Circuit's wrong, it's not the law here any more than it is in New York. 
I, I, so I, be... I wouldn't favor bringing Judge Carter here. I don't think that's a good idea. I think it invites trouble, actually, because once you start talking to members of the judiciary about potential plans, you, you, you create ideas and you start going down a road that maybe you don't want to end up going down. So I would support one, two, and three. I, I think that the ASL is premature. I think that that depends on number one. So we ought to find out what the community wants first. And, and John and I can work very diligently and very quickly to see if we can't come up with how to help the community in the interim while we're working on the ASL question and what does the community want. Okay. I, I, I'll just say, I, I, the only reason I thought of Judge Carter coming here is just because he's dealt with this in so many cities and he's seen what works and doesn't work, but your points noted. Um, any more comments, Bruce? I mean, Paul? Just one thing, uh, as far as where an ASL would go, I guess my primary question is how do we do this within our, our zonings? And uh, do we grant ourselves some sort of uh, conditional use permit? Uh, do we... I, that's a great staff question because I know that shelters have uh, are allowed in zones, um, other zones, and I don't actually know the details on that, but it's a great question that we should have staff. And, and then the other problem we have with location for an ASL somewhere is that I would imagine that it would be a heck of a lot easier if there was a sewer connection than if we had to put in a septic system can, sufficient to meet the needs of 40 people. So. I literally, I mean, I literally, when I said temporary, I meant temporary. I mean, pull in trailers and pull in a, a, you know, a shower trailer and a bathroom trailer. And, and because I sincerely believe that it's in my personal opinion that I know temporary is maybe a bit of a pipe dream, but I think we it really shouldn't be our issue. Okay. So, and it'll oh, keep her. Oh. Are we going to do these one at a time? Um, we can. Okay. Steve, I Steve? think I see. Yeah, you're, uh, you're muted, Steve. Yeah, I think we're heading in the right direction. You know, for the, and, and I'm, I'm not sure what you're going to try and get with the survey. I mean, to me, what people are going to want to know is, do we, what are we, do we want to take care of the homeless? It's probably going to get, you know, a, a lot of people saying that. The question is how, so maybe when we do that, we think of a way of how we present different options of what that we're, we're thinking about, right? Because I may say, I want to take care of the homeless. I don't want an ASL, but I agree with Bruce's plan. Or I don't like Bruce's plan. I like the shared uh, concept with another city. Uh, so, and and maybe the questionnaire should follow some meetings we do live in the city. I mean, maybe it's a process that says we go up to Point Doom and we take the room up there and have a meeting. We go, I mean, live meetings just meet, are much, people pay more attention. And I think they're able to ask questions. They walk away a lot more informed than they were just trying to answer a piece of paper on a, on a page. That's just one man's opinion. Just one little problem with live meetings, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> but we we all don't have to be there. I'm just saying. It's, 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 no, no, not a Brown Act problem. Much bigger. <laughs> What's that? This little COVID, COVID thing. I don't know if you've heard of it. Oh yeah, well, it. <laughs> okay. Um, Bang. Okay. I I, I, agree. I I think the outreach is is not easy, but we have to start somewhere. That's that's okay. another point. And uh, and the we other thing probably is, give input on it. Uh, because the other thing I, is, uh, put some time frames around when you want to get this done. Just, uh, you know, typically you want to have a targeted date. We, if we don't want this to drag out, we want to have, you know, the schedule for how we're going to do the outreach done in a couple of weeks. We want Bruce and John to get together, have have you know, a, a flushed out version the end of March. I, I don't know, whatever date you're looking at, but something that says you keep it moving forward because otherwise... It, it sort of gets mucked up in the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on. We'll be doing this again in December. Okay. I agree. Yes, Bruce. 
Well, as far as far as the John and my part, John, if you're amenable, I think we can have a um, proposal that we either agree or don't agree, but we can have a proposal by the first meeting in April. Cool. Agreed. All right. Well, I want to move this forward because I did tell staff it's two okay. two two big days. Oh, uh, Paul, do you have something to say? <laughs> no, nope, I'm just ready to vote. Do it okay. all in one motion. How can we do that? We have. <laughs> Let's do one at a time. Okay. So go public ahead. forum, and I'll say here that uh, why don't we each, if we interested, take responsibility to um, speak with staff or email staff with some thoughts, our personal thoughts on it, so everyone has a chance to give a little input on that and staff I know has experience with this, so they'll have their side of it. So are they, um, are they gonna like are they gonna come back to a city council meeting with the final product for our approval or are they just gonna go off on their own once they get our input? I would say we'd be probably smarter and a little more nimble if we let them rough draft um, for comments and they could uh, maybe rough draft. Let me get a let me get a, a Let's hear back from staff on that, but I'm not sure if it should come back to, I think it has to probably come back to a public meeting. So um, Reva can actually weigh in on that and help me along here. Um, I guess uh, you can give us direction this evening on what you would like, or we can draft a couple things uh, for you to look at and bring that back. So it's, it's I, I think draft a couple things and let us, let us uh, poke holes in it and, and, and change it. So that's my motion. And I think I do have a second. Karen, seconded. Okay. Can we have roll call on that, please? Mayor Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Hearing? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Crisanti? Yes. Motion carries. My second motion is for to look at opportunities to join with another either unincorporated or other city nearby on a joint facility. Um, I would think probably it's smart since there has been some work done on this over the last year or so. I don't know the amount of time with COVID, it's all blank. Maybe we could get a report back at the next city council meeting where we're at, and then we could give further directions after that. Because I know we That's have explored, we have explored some a number of places, and we do have information. So um, maybe we should start with that. Yes, uh, Mayor Pearson, I just want to let you know that the agenda for the March eighth agenda goes out uh, for for the March eighth meeting goes out tomorrow. So there will not be time for us to provide a report. Fair and enough. The following meeting on uh, March twenty second, you're going to be hearing the wireless ordinance. So. Um, I'm just con concerned about committing. Do you think uh, over committing for the wireless one? I'm just kidding. Um, so, okay, as the next available meeting, which sounds like the okay. first meeting. Thank you. Both. I just want to make sure we're clear. I don't want to overburden you. That, no, I appreciate your help on this. So that would be my motion. Um, I will second. Okay, can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. And my third motion is uh, for John and anyone else uh, legally uh, to work with Bruce on vetting his camping ordinance um, to bring back something that we can discuss at City Council. And should we give that a time of I guess we need, obviously our next couple of meetings are full. So sometime in April, maybe. We, we said we could do it the first meeting of April. But okay. When you say vet it, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll tinker. Well, with I it. mean, talking with the lawyer is what I mean by vetting. So um, coming to an agreement on what might be legal or either it can come back with John saying it's illegal and you're saying it's legal. That's, that's, that's certainly an option. Um, but let's, let's. And we'll try to work to compromise. Okay. Um, is my motion is my motion clear enough? Come back first meeting in April. Yeah. Okay. Good. And, and is it seconded still, Karen? I'll yeah. second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Karen. Whoever. Okay. Roll call, please. Mayor Pearson. Yes. Councilmember Yuri. Yes. Councilmember Fair. Yes. Councilmember Silverstein. Yes. 
Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Um, my fourth motion, actually, I misstated it, so I'm going to restate it. And the reason is, is just why wait in case? Let's, I'm trying to think the proper way to form this. I want to think about locations for an ASL and how it would work if there was a camping ordinance. And that's actually written here. I just didn't read to the end because I had just notes absolutely everywhere. So I, I don't know. I have a novel idea. I and mean, maybe it's a really horrible idea. And Reva can just tell me it's a horrible idea. But maybe over the working with staff or, or not, maybe the city councilors can come up with some ideas. And talk to the other people in the community and not burden staff at this moment on it, on where we might do if there was a camping ordinance, where that would work. If there was an ASL, where that might work. Bruce? I might have misunderstood your motion before actually. Are you, is, is your thought that the question is where would we put it if we decided to go forward with it? Yes. Because I thought you were saying we'll go forward with it and then we got to figure out where we're going to put it. Okay, if it, this is hypothetical. If I don't we, think we've I, had an, I, I think we need to move ahead and keep moving ahead strong and whatever we're going to do, whatever it is. But I don't think we're there as much as I want to be there. I think we need more public, more okay. time for public input. So it's, 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 it's where would it be if we decided to go forward with it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is that, Reva, is that too novel an idea to task actually city councilors with coming up with ideas or, or am, I, am I out on too much of a limb here? It, it's your meeting, Mayor. Um, you're welcome to, to make the decisions however the council wants and we'll okay. be happy to assist if you need us to. And, and council can feel free to individually talk with uh, through the city manager's office on getting help with the GIS maps or whatever else, zoning issues, whatever we need. But let's start with the actual city council and then our constituents can talk to us about it and tell us where no and where yes. And so maybe maybe we can do a little bit of an organic thing here. And I, as long as the city attorney is comfortable with, with any of this, it works for me. Are you comfortable, as as, You know, the concern is the Brown Act, as long as the, you know, we're not, yeah, no, individually. I guess you could with one other person, but yeah, no, no, not a group effort. Thank you. Okay. Oh my God. Okay, I'll second that. Okay. Is that motion clear enough, Heather? Um, let's throw it up on the screen here. Okay, thank you, Heather. Is that what you had in mind here? Oh, wait, okay. Should it specify location options? Directed staff, no. Um, I'm, I'm, we're, the idea is we're having the city councilors take the first stab at where my locations for both an ASL and how we would, where the camping ordinance would be permitted. You're talking about motor camping? No, I'm talking about related more to uh, Bruce and Steve's camping ordinance. Oh, so let me just comment on that. Okay. The proposal as it exists already was to have that as a second step that would have to be fleshed out over some period of time. The first step was simply to deal with the people who are not homeless at all, who are, who are taking advantage of a, a parking on the highway that aren't covered already by the parking rules we have. And then the second part, which was where you could be permitted to go places, the proposal was actually to hold off on establishing those until we could actually get buy-in from other places and see if we couldn't have something that would work elsewhere as well. So that's that's premature for the way that was proposed. Okay, that's fair. Um, then we'll just leave it to ASL locations. Do you want the council members to? Yeah, the council members are, are going to give their list. Let's give it a, a due date of one month um, of potential locations for, and then we can ask staff to. We can take a look at that list in public and ask staff whether to see if they're viable or not. But let's keep moving forward on everything we're doing.
Will you second that motion too, Karen? Yes. Okay, thank you. What, what date would we want to have that presented? Um, let's, let's one month from today. How's that? Is that enough time? It, and it, just to clarify, by one month, you mean that's the time frame in which council members would provide that information to staff? Correct. Uh, Mayor, can I just make sure, are we uh, discussing or are you thinking about having another special meeting to discuss these issues or are you looking to combine this on a regular, uh, regularly scheduled meeting? That's a fantastic question. It's a good question. I hate you for it because I was trying to end the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, um, I would suggest another special meeting might be. There's a lot I think that might be wise given... Yeah. You know, this this took us four hours already this evening, and so I think okay. it, it might so be let's wise. So we'll, we'll try to come up with a date for you. Probably mid-April uh, then. Mm -hmm. um, I'll come up with a, a date. We already have one special meeting in April for the uh, special budget hearing. Um, so let me just look at the calendar okay. and, and make sure we we can figure it all out. Okay, thank we'll you. We'll do it. As, I understand it's it's urgent, and we'll do it as soon as possible. I appreciate your help. Um, okay, so there's a motion second. Can we have roll call on that? Mayor Pearson? Yes. Councilmember Ferris? Yes. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Pratim Gersanti? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, thank you. I want to thank everyone tonight. I want to thank the city council. I want to thank all of the speakers, and I particularly want to thank the public that has showed up. Um, Please let your friends and neighbors know that um, the city is looking at seriously at what we need to do uh, to, to deal with our homelessness situation. And um, with that, I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Bruce? Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, roll call, please. Councilmember Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? Yep. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Grisanti? Yes. Mayor Pearson? Yes. Motion carries. Adios. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, staff. Thank you, staff. Thank you, everybody. Did a great job.